call the meeting to order. Good morning, everyone. This morning we are meeting to have a hearing and a discussion on great power competition is the way it's been phrased, the way we chose to put it in our hearing book is the Department of Defense's role in long-term major state competition, which is a complicated way of saying great power competition. Uh, we have three excellent witnesses this morning, uh, Dr. Alina Palayakova, uh, who is the President and CEO on the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, Abraham Denmark, Director of Asia Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and Dr. Thomas Mankin, President and Chief Executive Officer uh, at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. This is something that's been talked about for a long time: is this this so-called shift uh, to great power competition, supposedly uh, from our focus on counterterrorism, transnational terrorist threats, and primarily the Middle East uh, and Africa, to worrying more about what Russia and China are up to. What I hope we can accomplish this morning is to get a better idea of what that means in terms of policy. Uh, it's easy to say, but, but what do you do? Um, what exactly is it that Russia and China are doing that is contrary to our interests and what interests are we trying to pursue? And I don't feel to this point that that's been adequately explained. We, we've heard a lot of talk recently about how we need to draw down in Africa and a big part of the, the conversation there is the notion that we have a finite amount of resources within DOD, and if in fact uh, Russia and China are becoming more important, then we have to find some place else where we can do less, which I agree with and make, makes sense. Uh, but a lot of the great power competition is going on in Africa. Uh, Russia and China are very active in that part of the world, so what do we do there to sort of counter their activities? But laying over the top of all of it is to have a better understanding of what is it that Russia and China are doing that we wish, wish to oppose? Well, what basically is in our interests in this case? I mean, put, put most directly, Russia and China are now aggressively pushing an alternative view of the world and of governance, and that alternative view is based on autocracy, uh, the idea that democracy doesn't work, freedom doesn't work. Um, you need to have a strong man, and yes, it is always a man in their vision, um, to control things, um, that their government works better. And I think that is a very core threat to freedom and democracy, which are important to our interests and to global stability. Beyond that, their economic model, I think, can best be described as kleptocracy. Basically, the folks at the top control all the money um, and should not be subject to rules. And basically, they can do whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, and that any sort of international norms are simply inconvenient. I think we need to do a better job of explaining how that is contrary to our interests and contrary to the interests of the world. Lastly, I'm concerned that from the Armed Services Committee perspective, we tend to have a myopic view of great power competition. And that is, well, whatever they have militarily, we have to have more in order to beat them. I believe that competing with Russia and China is about a lot more than military might. There are a lot better, I believe, more cost-effective ways to deter their interests than by simply trying to engage in an arms race that we hope to win. Alliances are crucial uh, in containing these countries. Alliances certainly in Asia uh, will help us deal with China, but alliances in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere uh, will, will also help us. Then diplomacy and development are crucially important. A big part of what China is doing uh, is spreading money around. Now, they're, they're spreading it around in a very selfish way that is beginning to create problems for them, uh, but those development dollars are crucial to building the relationships necessary to, to, to win this, this ideological battle that we're engaged in, and I think we need to focus on that. You can't put out a budget that, that cuts the State Department and cuts USAID by 30 percent and then say that you care about state uh, great power competition, because you don't at that point. You are ceding the field uh, to, to our opponents. And last little piece of that point is I know there are some who, who look at what Russia and China are doing. They're concerned militarily. If we go head-to-head -head with them in a war, we're no longer guaranteed to win. Well, just by a simple math problem, if our mission is we have to be able to simultaneously defeat Russia and China in a war, as most of the war games show out, fought on their territory, while at the same time dealing with North Korea, Iran, and transnational terrorism, well, there is not enough money in the entire world to build a military that could do all of that. So we better come up with a strategy that doesn't require us to do all of that, 
in order to meet our interests, or we're, we're, we're simply spinning our wheels. So I, I hope we can, we can focus that. Um, this is the first, actually, in a series of hearings that I'm going to try, not try to do, um, I'm going to do, um, on uh, what is our strategy? How do we review our strategy? And the three big broad categories there are great power competition, rogue states, primarily Iran and North Korea, and containing transnational terrorism. Um, there are other pieces, that, but how does that fit together into a coherent strategy? Uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, and also the Q&A back and forth uh, with our members as we grow on our understanding of how to approach this crucially important issue. And with that, um, I will yield to Mr. Wilson for any opening statement he has. Thank you, Chairman Adam Smith and Dr. Palyakova, Mr. Denmark, Dr. Mencken. On behalf of Ranking Member Mac Thornberry and myself and colleagues, thank you for being with us today to discuss the Department of Defense's role in the long-term major state competition. We know that the Department of Defense has an enduring mission to provide capable, credible military forces needed to deter war and protect the security of our nation, peace through strength. Furthermore, we understand that the Department of Defense supplements a number of national capabilities to deter antagonistic behavior from our adversaries and strategic competitors. I am grateful that President Donald Trump's budget submitted yesterday reinforces our efforts to support our troops and military families. As we transition toward great power competition in line with the national defense strategy, this hearing topic is of crucial importance and we appreciate the leadership of Chairman Smith to have this as a beginning of several hearings. We look forward to your testimony today. I yield back to the Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, with that, I will yield to uh, Dr. Well, with one comment. Um, you're not limited to five minutes. We put the clock on just because we don't, you know, we can't have you go in 20, for instance. Um, so I, I don't want to cut you off, uh, but we have a lot of people here, a lot to get through. So if you can be as concise as possible, um, that would be much appreciated. Uh, Dr. Polyakova. Uh, Chairman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Thornberry, uh, Congressman Wilson, and distinguished members of the committee. It is an honor and privilege to address you today on this critical issue for United States national security. Thank you for inviting me to speak and address you. Great power competition has already shaped our world. Now its outcome will determine our future. As the 2017 National Defense and National Security Strategies correctly assessed, Russia and China are actively undermining U.S. power, influence, and interests. Since 2017, these activities have become even more pervasive. Most notably, Russian-Chinese military, economic, and political cooperation has grown, intensifying challenges to the United States. Both countries have increased investment in and development of new technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, with potentially dramatic effects on our national security and the nature of ge geostrategic competition. Both countries are also engaged in developing and exporting their own models of digital authorit authoritarianism, challenging U.S. national security interests in various parts of the world. As new digital technologies advance at an increasingly rapid pace, and our adversaries subvert and weaponize these technologies, the gap between the threats they present and our ability to respond will only widen. The outcome of the new era of geopolitical competition will be determined in the digital domain. Today, I'll focus on the medium and long-term threats emanating from Russia specifically. Russia presents a unique challenge to the United States. It is simultaneously a country in decline and a global power with proven ability and determination to undermine U.S. interests in multiple military and non-military arenas. Our resolve to respond must be commensurate with Russia's ambition and deliberate intent to chip away a U.S. leadership in the world and undermine the security of the United States and our core allies. Doing so means that the United States government should continue to invest not only in conventional but also non-conventional deterrence capabilities. I will briefly summarize the challenge Russia poses and how the U.S. should respond, which I elaborate in my written testimony. First, we must have a sober assessment of how Russia's domestic forces shape its foreign policy. Moscow faces serious security challenges uh, and financial and political constraints at home. Russia faces a stagnant economic forecast, but due to low debt and high reserves, this economy has proven to be quite resilient to U.S. and European sanctions and fluctuations in the oil and gas markets. Politically recently proposed constitutional changes from the Kremlin will likely de facto keep Putin in power for life, while the Kremlin will continue to repress dissent at home. 
In terms of Russia's military posture, uh, the Russian military modernization plan has led to significant improvements in Russia's ability to carry out uh, targeted attacks and air campaigns. Some estimates suggest that Russia's actual military spending is closer to 200 billion annually versus the 60 billion we usually see cited in official Russian documents. On the whole, however, Russia cannot outcompete the United States and our allies militarily, economically, or politically in terms of its lack of alliances to support its political agenda. But its ambition for great power status and Putin's tolerance for risk means that Moscow will continue to invest seek out and develop tools of asymmetric warfare as a low-cost, high-impact avenue for contesting U.S. interests across the world. In addition, we should not expect a change of course from Putin, who will continue to drive Russian foreign policy in a course that will contest U.S. interests and seek to fill power vacuums across the world. To that end, Russia has intensified its global activities beyond its immediate neighborhood since Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and invasion of Ukraine in 2014. In the Black Sea region specifically, Russia has de facto turned Ukraine's Crimea into a military base, stationing at least five known S-400 air defense systems there, adding troops and other weapons to fortify its position. This buildup has intensified over the last two years, allowing Russia to establish security dominance over the Black Sea. The culmination of these activities has produced a new iron curtain across the entire Black Sea region. But Russia seeks to contest U.S. interests not just in Ukraine and the Black Sea, but also in Syria, where its 2015 intervention have decisively shifted the trajectory of the conflict in Bashar al-Assad's favor. And in parts of Africa and South America, where Russian proxy military forces, such as the Wagner Group, are increasing operations and exporting the Syria model of protection and support to authoritarian leaders in exchange for access to strategic assets and military bases. The lesson we should take from Syria, where Russia has now established itself as the key power broker for the region, is that where the U.S. disengages, Moscow steps in to fill the void. In Africa, the Kremlin is positioning itself to do the same. Thanks to the, con to the Congress and the work of this committee especially, since 2017, the U.S. has invested in both military and non-military deterrence and containment measures, with a renewed commitment to the European Deterrence Initiative, EDI, support for counter-disinformation efforts via the U.S. State Department and the Global Engagement Center, and a new and assertive cyber strategy. The 2020 NDAA, in particular, took important steps to counter Russian malign activities in the non-kinetic domain. But there are places where we still need to do more. The U.S. should support Europe's efforts to do more for its own defense, and particularly the EDF Fund and PESCO, and to ensure that these efforts are complementary and not duplicative of uh, NATO efforts in the European space. The U.S. should continue to strengthen its efforts to counter Russian political warfare, of which information operations are only one part of the toolbox. It also includes cyber operations, influenced organized crime, bribery, subversion, and psyops, or psychological operations. The Russian toolkit has already gone global. The U.S. must also develop a comprehensive strategy for countering what I've called digital authoritarianism. Russia, like China, is actively exporting surveillance technologies across the world while tightening controls at home. The digital space, including the information ecosystem, is the new battleground um, in the coming decades. The Russian vision of warfare is multi-spectrum and multi-vector. Moscow has proven itself adept at using non-conventional means to, US, to challenge U.S. interests, and our response must be commensurate with the challenge we face if we are to win in the era of geostrategic contestation. Thank you. Chairman Smith, and Chairman Smith, and Ranking Member Thornberry, Congressman Wilson, distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor to testify before you today. As I begin, I want to make clear that these are my opinions alone and not those of the Wilson Center, the U.S. government, or any other organization. I'd like to make four main points on U.S.-China military competition. Given the short amount of time uh, I have, I'd discuss each briefly. First, the United States and China are engaged in a long-term competition over the relative distribution of geopolitical power in the Indo-Pacific and over the future of the liberal order that for decades has been critical to the region's stability and prosperity. This competition involves all aspects of national power, including military, technology, politics, economics, and ideology. In a multifaceted competition with China, the United States cannot afford to ignore any dimension of national power. 
This competition is primarily over two interrelated foundational elements of American strategy towards the Indo-Pacific. First, a central theme of American strategy towards the region has been to prevent the establishment of exclusive geopolitical dominance of the region by any other power. A risen China represents a significant challenge to this fundamental principle of American strategy. Additionally, a risen China represents a challenge to the long-term success of the liberal regional order. Although China does not, seek to, um, does not seek to explicitly overthrow the established order, Beijing has sought to carve out exceptions in established rules and norms it finds to be contrary to the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. Second main point, China seeks to establish itself as the dominant power in the Indo-Pacific and has developed a tailored military capability designed to undermine the ability of the U.S. military to operate and project power into regions associated with key contingencies along China's periphery. Beijing's ultimate vision for the future envisages a revitalized China that is stable and prosperous at home, dominant in the Indo-Pacific, and able to shape events around the world through an informal hierarchical system with China at the center. Xi Jinping has established the goal of fully transforming the PLA into a world-class force by the middle of the 21st century. The PLA's objective is to be capable of fighting and winning so-called informatized local wars and seeks to erode the ability of the United States to intervene in a conflict and successfully uphold U.S. security commitments in the Indo-Pacific. Yet China does not seek war. Instead, China has employed so-called gray zone tactics that are calculated to avoid an armed conflict while still advancing China's broader political ambitions. Third main point, the Department of Defense can play a, a critical role in supporting U.S. geopolitical competition with China by pursuing a range of initiatives that sustain conventional deterrence, build resilience against Chinese coercion, and ensure the ability of the U.S. military to respond decisively in a conflict or crisis. And the fourth main point, to achieve these ends, the United States should pursue a broad array of initiatives that empower U.S. allies and partners, change how we fight, build on U.S. technological advantages, update regional uh, force posture, and make difficult choices that prioritize competition with China over other challenges around the world. I won't go into depth of each of these in my presentation this morning, but just touch on a few critical issues. First, a unique and critical advantage for the United States in the Indo-Pacific is its network of alliances and partnerships. As competition with China intensifies, the United States should strengthen these relationships. Moreover, to sustain the ability of the U.S. military to maintain credible deterrence in the Indo-Pacific, the United States must change how it goes to war. Uh, this will require renewed emphasis on dispersion, unpredictability, resilience, and mobility. Additionally, the United States should conduct a review of its regional force posture with an eye to supporting new concepts of operations under development. The United States should establish a significant dedicated fund along the lines of the European Deterrence Initiative to support a renewed and more resilient military posture in, in Indo-PACOM. Finally, truly prioritizing the Indo-Pacific and competition with China in U.S. foreign policy and national security strategy will inevitably have significant budgetary implications. In an environment of finite resources, this of course means making difficult choices and accepting risk in other areas. In conclusion, there is no doubt that the Indo-Pacific will be a critical region in the 21st century. The issues we confront today are of historic consequence. Ultimately, despite the significant challenges we face, I remain fully confident in the ability of the United States to ultimately succeed in this competition and maintain regional peace and stability. Again, thank you very much for inviting me today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Mankin. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Ranking Member Thornberry, Congressman Wilson, members of the committee, thank, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the vital role of the Department of Defense in competing over the long term with China and Russia. As you know, the top priority accorded to this challenge was acknowledged in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And as a member of the Independent National Defense Strategy Commission, I studied the defense strategy in detail and worked with my colleagues to develop recommendations on how the United States can meet its defense objectives. Now, one of the most immediate challenges facing the United States is the need to understand the multidimensional challenge posed by China and Russia, one that includes not only increasingly sophisticated military threats, but also integrated use of political warfare and economic statecraft. <coughs> China and Russia are competing with us every day, both around the globe and across the spectrum of functional domains. And their actions do not neatly adhere to our view of peace versus war, nor do the challenges that they pose align neatly with our bureaucratic silos. In some domains, 
such as space and cyberspace, what they're doing goes far beyond a common notion, our common notion of competition. And most consequently, with the reality of competition with China and Russia, comes the increasing possibility that we could face one or both of them in war. However unlikely in the absolute, that contingency is more likely today than it was five years ago. And I would note that this competition, far from being confined to the Western Pacific and, and Europe, uh, is really increasingly global. And so there is a mismatch between the, the nature of the challenge we face and the way that we're organized to deal with it. And certainly the United States will not be able to counter these threats without close cooperation with partners who share our priorities and our values. And so as we, as we develop a strategy, as we develop our concepts, and as we develop our capabilities, it's imperative that we work closely with our allies and partners. And if we want our allies and partners to do more, we'll need to ensure that they have access to the means necessary to do more, including through arms exports. Now, as a member of the National Defense Strategy Commission, you know, we found that uh, as good as the National Defense Strategy is, we believe that the, the department needs to rethink some of the assumptions underpinning it, or at least justify how it'll account for alternative contingencies. The NDS is built around planning for one major war, thus abandoning the two-war construct that has guided the Department of Defense's planning for decades. Uh, it's unclear why the department has adopted a one-war concept despite the threats posed by two major power competitors, as well as uh, the regional rogues uh, and, uh, and transnational terrorism, as, as you, Chairman Smith, mentioned at the outset. Uh, but if we are to have a, a one-war strategy, I think a, a priority needs to be how we handle other theaters and other contingencies, including through deterrence. Now, if we hope to meet the challenges posed by China and Russia, we'll need to overhaul dramatically many of our capabilities as quickly as possible. We've fallen behind in many areas because of our focus on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency over the past two decades. Each military service clearly confronts its own shortfalls and challenges, and the addition of, uh, of Space Force, while a, uh, a good uh, remedy to make sure that space gets the attention that it deserves, also has a bill attached to it. And we should not underestimate the costs that will be associated with standing up a new service and combatant command. Many of the elements of the U.S. nuclear arsenal are, are rapidly aging and rapidly approaching the end of their service lives uh, at a time when America's adversaries are modernizing and in some cases expanding their nuclear capabilities. So in a world where we face competition with China and Russia, in a world where we face North Korea with nuclear capabilities and Iran that's seeking them, and in a world where the Defense Department is planning for one war, I would argue that nuclear deterrence is likely to be more rather than less important. Other shortfalls need to be addressed as well in terms of power projection, gaining dominance of the electromagnetic spectrum, and, and in, in cyberspace. Overall, we've reached a point where doing more of the same is insufficient to the challenges we faced. Rather, the Defense Department needs to invest boldly in new concepts of operations and the capabilities to carry them out. Promising approaches such as DARPA's Mosaic Warfare Program with its emphasis on gaining de decision superiority over an adversary deserve support, as do the low-cost disaggregated forces that it envisions. More broadly, Developing new concepts and fielding new organizations to deter Chinese and Russian aggression should become the urgent focus of the Defense Department. And in my uh, written testimony, I, I lay out a couple of points of departure, including a, a new concept of deterrence that could involve U.S. and allied ISR networks uh, composed of unmanned systems to help uh, shine the light figuratively and, and literally on gray zone aggression and, and deter, uh, deter acts of, uh, of greater aggression. A new concept of conventional defense involving the development of mobile land-based conventional anti-ship, anti-air, and land attack missiles. And we also sorely need new concepts for defending our, our bases, because however much we want to disperse our forces, we're still going to be reliant to a, to a large degree on, on fixed bases. Now, the development of new concepts and capabilities should not be ends in and of themselves. Too often in the past, such experiments have been side projects that create a facade of innovation without actually having any substantial impact. As a result, the forces we have today 
and the, many of the forces we're currently procuring are out of alignment with the world of 2020 and beyond. The objective of concept development and experiment, experimentation must be to inform major shifts in investment and the size and shape of the U.S. Armed Forces. Our resources are clearly not limited, and the American taxpayer deserves to know that his dollars are being spent wisely. That having been said, history will ultimately judge our efforts not merely or mainly on efficiency, but by their ultimate effectiveness. Current funding levels and processes are not conducive to waging and winning a long-term strategic competition. The United States defense budget is not keeping pace with inflation or the challenges pay, uh, facing our country. Over the past decade, political dysfunction has led to disruptions in defense spending and weakened America's ability to, to compete. In particular, defense spending was slashed substantially by the Budget Control Act of 2011 to the tune of $539 billion between 2012 and 2019. BCA cuts led the DOD to rely on overseas contingency operations funding to pay for operations in the Middle East and elsewhere. And it'll take years of increased funding to ensure that the US military is prepared to compete with China and Russia. The slight increase in, in DOD's uh, FY 2020 budget is helpful, but still not enough to fund US defense strategy with minimal risk. The commission re uh, recommended the uh, elimination of the final year BCA caps, as well as 3 to 5 percent annual increase in DOD's budget in inflation-adjusted terms. This level of growth would help undo the damage inflicted by BCA cuts and sustain the U.S. military's ability to uphold its commitments and project power. And to further incre uh, insulate the de uh, department's spending from political disruptions, Congress should give DOD the authority to spend O&M funds across the current fiscal year and the subsequent one. It should also consider producing five-year budget agreements for defense in order to uh, enable the department to safely conduct long-term planning. We need a strategy for the long-term because the threats we face are our long-term. Thank you, Chairman, uh, uh, Ranking Member, Committee Members. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Just following up on that one point, I guess is what I struggle with, is when you, when you look at the, the size of the challenge, if you presume that we have to have a military that can do everything you just said, um, that's impossible. I, you would, I think you would agree. So what, what would it look like? I mean, what would our, forget the money for the moment, what would our military look like in terms of what more would we have where we would go, okay, we are adequately meeting the challenge of, I mean, gosh, fighting two major wars to begin with seems like, like an impossible thing to prepare for, um, unless you want to like just dump everything else in the budget, and everything else in the budget is, is passingly relevant um, to our national security, and I would submit to the great power competition itself. So what, what would it look like? If we, if we were to be sitting here and imagining that, you know, eh, it seems like it's okay, how many more ships would we have? How many more planes would we have? How many more nuclear weapons would we have? Huh? What more would we have? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think there's a lot of room between a one-war strategy and doing everything. And I think we need to explore that space. So historically, the Defense Department has had a, you know, a, a two-war construct. Not because I think uh, we honestly thought that we I was, were. I was going to say, do you think that was ever really true? Uh, I mean, that we had the concept, but were we actually in a position to fight two wars? But, but those forces for the second war, if you will, I think were vital to deterrence deterrence of, of other, uh, of, of other uh, acts of aggression. So I think what we've lost in just going to a one-war construct is how we deal with everything else. And um, to include the role of conventional deterrence, to include the role of nuclear deterrence, to include the role of allies, to include a whole bunch of things. Uh, I think that has historically been one of the main values of thinking beyond a single war, is it forces you to think about you know, the, uh, the other contingencies that can arise. And in fact, you know, we, we, we have a lot of experience fighting major wars, right? Uh, and we have a lot of experience fighting on multiple fronts. And we need, I think we need to continue that as we, as we go forward. Um, and particularly in, in an era where we are facing competition with, with, with China and Russia. And as Dr. Polyakova said, where China and Russia are increasingly cooperating, it's not too difficult to envision uh, a situation where we're in a crisis or in a confrontation one place and another great power decides to try to exploit that. We just need to be prepared. We need to think, think that through. 
Understood. But, I mean, you would agree that we're not just preparing for one war right now. We're, we're engaged in a number of efforts, you know, countering terrorism, dealing with Iran and North Korea. It's not like all we're doing is preparing for one war. So I, I, I don't think that's an really either or at this point. I do think there has to be some, some discipline to that conversation. And one of, the, one of the elements of my written remarks that I didn't get to in my spoken, uh, my spoken testimony, uh, and it was one of the things that really came out from the National Defense Strategy Commission, is that the Defense Department has really let its analytical capability decline. So the uh, analytical ability to look at different permutations, different scenarios, and judge the adequacy of, of the defense program really has diminished, and I think that's one of the things, one of the, one of the key steps that needs to be undertaken is to regain that analytical capability so that defense leaders can answer your question based okay. on, based on uh, analytical work. I have one more quick quick question for, well, let's focus on Mr. Denmark, Dr. Polyakova. Um, what role does development play in this competition? You know, what, how important is it that we have a robust USAID that we're actively engaged in development policy in the world? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. I think it's absolutely critical. Um, as you correctly said, we can't fight all wars with conventional means. Uh, the kinds of cuts that have been proposed to the U.S. State Department and USAID um, that support democracy work, that support independent media and organizations that do a whole range of critical services uh, to ensure that we have more allies in the world, not less, is absolutely critical to make sure that we are not spending more blood and treasure in wars. Thank you. Ms. Denmark? Um, I agree. Just as a as an initial caveat um, to my answer, my wife is a contractor with USAID. Um, but with that being said, I haven't discussed that, this uh, specific issue with her. Um, I think looking back, one of the, of the last several administrations, one of the strongest advocates for diplomacy and for development has come from the Department of Defense. Uh, I worked for Secretary Gates, and he was a very strong advocate for, for diplomacy and development, uh, as have sep uh, subsequent Secretaries of Defense. And um, this was actually my first reaction, uh, Mr. Chairman, when you mentioned uh, emerging competition in Africa, um, that at least uh, from a China context, while there may be a bit of a military dimension to this, the primary aspect of competition in Africa is much broader and multi-domain. And effective American tools uh, in, in de the developing world, especially in Africa, would probably not be military, but involve development and other acts of diplomacy. If I could, uh, defense, diplomacy, development are complements to one another. Uh, they are ultimately not substitutes, right? U.S. diplomacy is much more effective when backed by credible military power. And there's only so much you can do to make up for, you know, for a lack of military power. So I think they are, they're all vital complements to one another. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, should be for being here today. Uh, your insight has been very positive. And uh, Dr. Mencken, DOD's policy chief recently said that China poses the greatest threat to the Defense Department. The National Defense Strategy clearly lays out a framework recognizing that great power competition has returned, particularly in regard to China. Given your role as serving on the National Defense Strategy Commission, uh, what is that a competition with China, how does it go beyond economic competition to military competition? What resources does DOD need to ensure that international rules-based order and sovereignty are protected? Uh, thank you. I would agree that China is the greatest challenge that, that we face and will face in coming, in coming decades. Um, that's not to dismiss the, the, the challenge posed by Russia, and there are some similarities, but there, are also, there also are some, some differences. I think, as, uh, as the other members of this panel have said, it, it, the, the, the threat posed by China is, is a multi-dimensional multi challenge. And what we have is a competitor that, that takes a long view, that takes an integrated view of economics, uh, politics, information, military affairs, uh, and is using that to, to forward its interests, its interests in the Western Pacific and beyond the, the Western Pacific. If the Chinese Communist Party leadership stay, seeks to stay in power, seeks to insulate itself from, from challenges, and also seeks to increase its, uh, its influence. So it is increasingly a, uh, a, global, a global challenge and a multidimensional one. Thank you very much. And Dr. Polyakova, I appreciate very much. 
uh, you citing the actual Russian military expenditures. Uh, it, it's somewhat sad because uh, their uh, prior uh, existence has been to burden the people of Russia with such a military expenditure which reduces the capabilities for the Russian people. Uh, keeping that in mind, many of our European allies are overly dependent on the use of Russian natural gas for the energy needs and the construction of the Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2 pipeline has been particularly uh, something we need to observe. In what ways will Russia use that energy reliance to put pressure on our European allies and further their strategic goals? And in what ways can we counter that advantage? Well, first, I would, I would commend the work of this committee and the U.S. Congress more broadly for including sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in, in the 2020 NDAA. I think those were long overdue, and I was uh, uh, very glad to see them included. Uh, that being said, Russia has a very long history of using energy resources, especially as a form of economic warfare. Um, in fact, energy fits quite squarely into Russia's own vision uh, of political warfare more broadly, which includes a whole other set of tactics and tools. Uh, the expectation, is, as Russia has done in Ukraine, uh, with some of the debates over gas transit fees uh, going through Ukraine to Europe, it will continue to use pipeline projects as a way to basically import corruption, import kleptocracy into these countries, and try to gain a foothold to influence European politics and policy. And last point um, is that these projects are also incredibly divisive within the European Union. Thank you, and as you cited that, it was uh, just so recently uh, the threats against uh, Belarus, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, indeed the people of Belarus now see, uh, I particularly appreciate Secretary Pompeo visiting Minsk and uh, letting the people of Belarus know that we look forward to working with them in the future. And Mr. Denmark, uh, since 2004, China has established 100 Confucius Institutes at American universities, and now they are because of recommendations from the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, uh, we are studying uh, by GAO a request for assessment of the risk of China's efforts to co-op foreign researchers uh, at U.S. universities to unlawfully appropriate research and other knowledge to benefit the People's Republic of China. From some of these universities uh, hosting Confucius Institute and DOD contracts, what recommendations do you suggest to protect our national intelligence and defense research? Uh, thank you, Congressman Wilson, for that, uh, that question. Um, China, China's use of Confucius Institutes and other uh, avenues of influence, not only in the United States but around the world, is a central aspect of uh, China's broader strategy for influence around the world. Um, uh, which uh, Ma Chairman Mao actually referred to as magic weapons of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and we've produced a lot of analysis on that, on this issue in the Wilson Center. Um, China is seeking uh, access to foreign technology. Uh, it requires it both for military and for civilian purposes, and it will employ any means to get them, either uh, legally, illegally, openly, covertly, they will do what it, what it takes to get there. We have seen, unfortunately, several instances in which um, the, the chi in which the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese intelligence and, service. I'm, I'm sorry, but the gentleman's sorry. time has expired. I should have sorry. pointed this out early on. We, we try to keep it to five minutes to try to get through everybody. Thank you all. Even if it's in the middle right. of an answer. I, sorry, I'll, I I'll try not to yeah. just cut you off, but if we can try to as close as possible be done at the five minute mark, that would be great. Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a growing threat to U.S. national security and space from adversaries, particularly Russia and China. Dr. Mankin, uh, you state in your testimony that the two countries have been attempting to replicate US, U.S. space capabilities and develop counter space capabilities to degrade our advantage. How can the DOD be more effective uh, countering Russia and Chinese threats to U.S. assets in space? Thank you, Congressman. That's an excellent question. I think you're, you're right that they're, they're both, uh, both Russia and China are building up their own space capabilities, are also building up the ability to deny us the use of space. I think, I think uh, Space Force is, is, a, is a good first step to have an organization that really is charged with uh, operations in, in space. I think we also need to think very seriously about uh, deterrence in space, how we deliver messages uh, to c 
competitors when they do things uh, that we see as threatening in space. And we also need to minimize, diversify our, uh, our, our dependence on, on space. That's a little bit easier for, for Russia and China where most of the conflicts that they foresee would be home games so they, can, they have alternative, ready alternatives to space. But I think we need to look, for, look at uh, space alternatives like uh, using unmanned aerial systems, using uh, other, other means to be able to mitigate the risk that, uh, uh, that we face in space. Thank you. Uh, to all witnesses, how can the DOD improve upon our strategy to counter China's military civil fusion policy? Um, in terms of civil military fusion, um, the Chinese, when they talk about civil military relations, and it's in a very different context as us, for them it's about appropriating civilian resources and technology uh, for military purposes. Um, I think we need to be nuanced in our approach to this. The Department of Defense, I think, has done a very credible job of working on these issues, of identifying challenges in terms of Chinese engagement in critical U.S. supply chains, um, the challenges posed by Chinese investments, um, but has been a bit, um, uh, has been a bit, uh, could use more surgical, a more surgical approach to these things. Instead of cutting with a broad brush that any sort of Chinese in, in, in investment in any company is seen as a threat, but rather digging into these investments, understanding who we're actually talking about, understanding what the technologies are, and finding a way to mitigate risk rather than completely de develop a way to have zero risk at all, which I think is unfortunately impossible. And I would also add to that that I think clear communication between government and industry and, and academia really is vital. Um, that both sides need to be talking to one another. There needs to be a, a free flow of information on, on both sides. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Polyakova, how can DOD better work with our allies to counter Russian aggression in Europe, specifically Russia's hybrid warfare tactics? Thank you for the question, Congressman. As I outlined in some detail in my written testimony, um, one, we sh must continue to invest in NATO and EDI. Uh, continued un uninterrupted funding for the European Deterrence in Initiative is critical to sending a very clear signal to Russia that the United States does stand behind its allies, um, especially in Europe's eastern flank. Uh, one issue that uh, we have to continue to think through is issues of interoperability and military mobility across Europe. The United States uh, will lead uh, one of the largest military exercises. Uh, their preparation is starting already in May and June, uh, the Defender 2020 exercises. I think these kinds of exercises are critical for showing um, our ability to respond, but also I'm putting, uh, for putting the burden of escalation back on Russia versus uh, the United States and our European allies in NATO. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Hi. Uh, Dr. Polakova, um, I appreciate your, uh, your, your testimony and, um, and your pointing out the issue of what Russia is doing to advance its nuclear capabilities, uh, which of course raises the issue of our nuclear capabilities. Um, because in order for us, as um, Dr. Manukin says, um, in order for us to have credible deterrence, uh, we have to have capable and credible nuclear capabilities. Now, you point out some of the new weapons that Russia has, has uh, produced. Now, these aren't, I mean, we, many times people throw around the word Russia's nuclear modernization, and that sounds like what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is modernize nuclear weapons, which is replace the capabilities we currently have with, uh, with uh, modern capabilities, meaning weapons capable of, of achieving the exact same goal, only with modern components, uh, modern delivery systems. What they're doing is not modernization. What they're doing is creating whole new uh, capable systems. Uh, you have in your testimony, uh, Avangard, which is the hypersonic boost weapon. We have nothing like this. Uh, the Kenzal, which is an air-launched ballistic nuclear capable missile, uh, brand new. Um, their ground-launched uh, cruise missile, uh, which is the INF Treaty Violator, the SSC-8, um, the Verduga uh, KH-101, which is a nuclear-capable air-launched cruise missile, their Skyfall nuclear-powered uh, nuclear arm missile. There's never been anything like Skyfall on the planet. This is not nuclear modernization. The Poseidon, 
uh, an underwater um, unmanned system uh, that's like an underwater cruise missile, nothing ever like it on, on the planet. Uh, all of these are incredibly destabilizing weapons, and no matter how much we spend just to try to replace the things that we have, we are not even trying to, to match these capabilities, which means it, it undermines our deterrence. New York Times, in just doing uh, an analysis of the President's budget on what the price tag is going to be for nuclear modernization points out that some of the weapons that the President is actually going to start funding that we've all called for uh, modernization as part of our um, uh, nuclear weapons uh, and, and nuclear uh, uh, posture review uh, are 40 years old. Uh, I'd like each of you, if you could respond to the place that we're in right now as we're facing these new weapons that have never existed before that, by the way, I, I would conjecture have um, first strike capabilities, regardless of what the, the intention is on the other side, first strike capabilities, and we're just trying to be able to maintain what we have. If each of you would comment on what does that do for this um, uh, near-peer or power-to-power or, uh, -power competition that we have with our adversaries. Thank you, Congressman, that uh, absolutely important question. Um, I was say just one caveat before I answer. One is that uh, while Russia and especially Mr. Putin really like to show off these new capabilities, uh, there's still a lot of questions about, about their actual operational And, and you've not had classified briefings that we receive. Mm -hmm. So in giving us that caveat, let me assure you that we have received classified briefings that are very concerning and, and, and answer that, that. Okay. You do have access to information I do not have. Um, uh, I will say that this, the, the kind of disparity you describe is a direct consequence of the development of Russia's nuclear posture and the U.S. nuclear posture in basically opposite directions, uh, at least for the last decade, but certainly even before. And we do find ourselves in a position where uh, we are far behind um, in developing the, the kinds of capabilities that would match what the Russians have been developing um, over the course of their own military modernization program. Um, I will say that you know, for Russia, nuclear posture is the most important guarantee of its own security uh, because it does lack other uh other capabilities to guarantee its own security in the homeland, and that is why they I understand, but you do find the weapons concerning. I do find them very Dr. concerning. Dr. Mnuchin? Congressman, I th the American people have gotten huge value from uh, the past investments in the U.S. nuclear deterrent, M maybe too much, right, in that w administrations, Democrat and Republican, have kicked nuclear modernization down the road, so that what we now face is the imperative of nuclear modernization, or the alternative of essentially unilateral disarmament. And, and we can talk about how we got here, but we are where we are, where we are unfortunately. Mr. Mark, the bill's coming due. And um, what do you have to say? Very, very rapidly. Um, modernization, ensuring our nuclear weapons are capable, that, deterrent, that nuclear deterrence remains um, effective is very important. The nuclear dynamic with China is very different than the nuclear dynamic with Russia. I understand we're running out of time, but I'd be happy to get into that at a later time or with you privately. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to turn our attention back to Africa. Um, uh, we're seeing uh, rapid economic uh, growth uh, coupled with uh, a growth in conflict in certain regions uh, around the continent. Uh, China has dramatically increased its presence, um, certainly a, a military presence, but its economic presence is, is exploding. Uh, Russia has a notable, noticeable presence, the private uh, uh, armies, uh, and also an economic presence. Uh, the question for each of you, and if you could take maybe no more than in a minute and 10 seconds each or a minute each, uh, what is the great power competition? What does it look like in Africa? Uh, what is the role of the DOD, particularly now as Secretary Esper is looking at force optimization, maybe a reduction, maybe a decrease, uh, but also the, what the role is um, in addition to the size? And is it time for an Africa reassurance initiative that would sort of be a blend of the European deterrence initiative, which, which is heavy military, and the Asia reassurance initiative, which is a lot more diplomatic and developmental? Thank you. And we can go start with uh, Dr. Uh, Polyakova and then work uh, down to the other side. Thank you. Um, thank you, Congressman. In my uh, written testimony, I spent a significant amount of time talking about Russia's engagement in Africa, especially. Uh, the Russian strategy is, is very different than the Chinese strategy, mainly because Russia does not have the kinds of resources to commit uh, to development projects uh, that's more of a long-term game. As elsewhere, Russia tries to fill vacuums, fill power voids, and exploit 
uh, issues and tensions that are already there on the ground. So basically in every single conflict in Africa, we now see the presence of Russian proxy military forces, most notably the, the Wagner Group, but there are also others that are active um, in, in various uh, arenas in Africa and Libya and Sudan, Mozambique, uh, CAR, and elsewhere. Um, as we consider our own priorities in the United States, and particularly the uh, pull out or potential reduction of forces in Africa, I would just note that we, as the United States, even maintaining a small force acts as a deterrent on Russian activities, given how relatively small those activities are. It's a few hundred proxy military forces. But as soon as we pull away, and this is the lesson from Syria, the Russians will step in relatively low resources that will dramatically shift uh, the various conflicts that's engaged in on the ground. Thank you. China's strategy with Africa is primarily political and economic. Um, China likes to cast itself as the champion of the developing world and has regular high-level engagements with leaders across Africa, with them visiting, with Chinese officials visiting Africa, African officials visiting China, um, promoting um, the trade agreements, ac gaining access to African uh, resources, um, attempting to build economic and political connections between Africa and China, um, but China's objectives are different than how we would see how we'd see from the United States or how we've seen from even from Russia, and that there is very little interest in providing public goods. Uh, we recently saw China establish a military base in Djibouti. This is this base is not going to be used to help sustain stability. It's really being used to protect Chinese people, Chinese interests, Chinese shipping. And so similarly, if we see a military expanded footprint by the Chinese in Africa, I expect them to see I expect to see them doing more to protect Chinese people who are operating, Chinese business people in the US role. who are operating there. And they see the United States as a competitor in Africa. Um, but I think that the United States role needs to be to sustain, build stability, to enhance robust um, economic growth across the continent, um, but also to ensure that liberal democratic government. And the role of the DOD in doing that. I think the Department of Defense is primarily a supporting role in, in Africa. Increase or decrease troop, troop levels? Um, I think in terms of troop levels, it, it's, I, I'd say it's probably at an okay mm -hmm. point. I wouldn't want to see too much of an increase because I don't think that's where the bulk of our military competition Thank you. Dr. Mankin. Yeah, Congressman, the one thing that I would add is actually a piece of good news, which is that we have capable allies uh, whose interests align with ours in Africa, first and foremost, France. And so to answer the question of, of, of DOD posture or U.S. military posture, I think however we move forward, we should be doing it in close consultation with our French allies. They have been bearing part of the burden. They, I believe, are, uh, are willing to continue to do it, but they need support. Uh, they need support in terms of U.S. capabilities and to a limited uh, extent U.S. forces as well. And then just sort of quick, uh, in terms of the initiative, um, you know, we, we did the European Deterrence Initiative, Reassurance Initiative, for, as the name suggested, to reassure. Uh, you didn't have to do an initiative. You could have just done the underlying um, investments. Is it time for an initiative to send a signal that we're taking Africa seriously and we're in, a, in a coordinated fashion, yes or no? I think that would send a strong message, yes. I would agree. Agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go to uh, Mr. Denmark and, and Dr. Uh, Monken. If, if you look at where we are as United States military and the challenges that we have around the world, uh, we look at having to project power uh, in places like the Pacific uh, and areas like the North Atlantic in order to counter what we see today as near-peer adversaries. And what we're seeing is those near-peer adversaries continue to expand their reach. You know, we see the Chinese now having a, uh, a Chinese naval facility at Djibouti. We see them operating in the North Atlantic. We see them outside the first island chain. So what happens, as you have pointed out in that realm, is, is our adversaries continue to try to deny us space to operate in uh, without putting our forces at risk. They also, too, I think are pretty intuitive in looking at what we can do within that realm, not only with our capability at sea, which is where we try to push them back and try to deter them, but they also look at some other elements, and that is something that doesn't always get mentioned, and that is with those forces, how do we support those forces, the logistics of those forces? And the question I have for both of you is, in looking at where we are today, as we talk about advancing our ability to project power, uh, which normally is talk about 
uh, warships, about capabilities within combat systems, with looking at where we place our forces, those, those strategic elements. One of the things that doesn't get mentioned is the atrophying of our support system, the atrophying of being able to sustain those forces. Listen, we, we've, got, we've got a great first punch, but the question is, is you know, do we have enough supplies out there pre-positioned? Can we get fuel to the fleet? Can we do all the things necessary to sustain that? And if you look at where we are historically, and of course, folks accuse me of saying, Rob, you're living in the past, but it's a pretty simple formula. Look at World War II. Look at what happened in World War II. Where did our adversaries go to try to inflict the most impact on our forces? They went after our support ships. 80% of the tonnage sunk in World War II were not warships, they were support ships. So give me your perspective on where we are today, support-wise and logistics-wise, to support our ability to deter our adversaries at distance. Congressman, that's a, it's an excellent point. Uh, logistics is a uh, decidedly unsexy topic, but as you point out, it, 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 is, uh, it is a vital one. And whether it's our, uh, our naval logistics fleet, whether it's the logistics supporting our, our, our air force, our ground forces, um, we do not have a, a, a logistics system that is prepared for great power competition or the prospect of great power conflict. We, we have been, uh, maybe taking too many pages out of the commercial book uh, and focusing on efficiency and just-in-time logistics, use of, use of commercial hulls, commercial vendors. And uh, in other words, I think we've built our logistical system on some assumptions that are uh, poor ones for the era that we're in, let alone the, the prospect of, uh, of conflict. I would add, in addition to what Dr. Mencken said, um, that our experiences over the last almost 20 years of, of conflict has allowed us to flow logistics in a relatively open uh, and secure way, in, in a way that um, if we have conflict with the Chinese, um, our ability to flow logistics uh, without impediment will be severely challenged. Now, the, our posture in the Asia Pacific, I talked about this a bit in my written testimony, has been historically based on a relatively small number of large bases. And those bases are increasingly under threat by Chinese um, precision strike capabilities. And so the b ability to rapidly distribute and preposition uh, logistical supplies across the region so that we don't have to wait on the long logistical chain from back home, but rather can distribute and operate from unpredictable places um, across the Indo-Pacific, I think, is especially important. And it's one of the issues I talked about in terms of revitalizing and, and revising American posture in the Indo-Pacific. I have one more question for, for all the witnesses. In light, of, in light of the release of yesterday's FY21 defense budget, do you believe that we have the proper direction and resources based upon that to counter in multi-domain spectrum our adversaries, our near-peer adversaries? Congressman, I think it's, it's a start, uh, but as I pointed out in my written testimony, I think what's really needed is sustained effort. So, you know, we could look at any, any president's budget, any, any, any budget, and it's just a slice. What we really need is, is sustained, sustained effort, particularly just to take the, the point of logistics. Fixing our logistical system, say, to, to allow the Air Force to actually conduct distributed operations is not something that's going to be fixed in any given budget. It's going to require Dr. Mankin is going to have to have the last word on that. Uh, the other two can submit things for the record if they want. Uh, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as former Secretary Mattis always uh, emphasized that uh, military's purpose is to support and bolster the work of uh, uh, U.S. economic and State Department interests. Uh, I want to really direct my questions to Dr. Poryakova in, in this respect. Um, first of all, uh, I agree with the work of the support of this committee and the administration with EDI and the rotation of troops in Europe. I think it's important. But let's get into something just as important, if not more important. That's uh, the fact that uh, our economic interests are here. Uh, this administration is in getting involved in a tariff fight with our allies in Europe. Instead of working for a free trade agreement with the EU uh, as a whole, not just uh, bilateral, and now a separate uh, one with the UK that parallels that. Uh, that's the way to stand up to China, because together we have half the world's GDP, and we're dealing from strength. It's also the strongest thing we can do uh, with uh, Russia to fight back. 
But I also want to talk now about the fact that the backup to this military, it's really not backup, but the efforts of the administration with what's going on, uh, there's issues of resolve of the U.S. and there's downright contradictions. Let me, there's a many, let me give you some. Pulling out of Syria without even notifying our allies when they had troops on the ground. Pulling out of the INF Treaty without even consulting in advance with our European allies. Getting involved with the JCPO uh, that we went in together, pulling out of that, the conflicts and sanctions that surround that that affect our European allies, uh, and indeed some of the actions surrounding Ukraine itself. Uh, look at the fact that while the peace talks were going on between Ukraine uh, and Russia, in the shadow of those peace talks, the President invited Foreign Minister Lavrov to the White House at that time. And in the July 25th, 2019 phone call with the President and President Zelensky, he wanted President Zelensky to investigate his own country in terms of their interference in the U.S. election when all our intelligence is saying they were not involved, that it was indeed Russia. We're sending these contradictory messages. We're undercutting our efforts with our allies. Now, we can sit here and talk about our, our military work, and, and that's so important. But this affects everything we're doing, including that military posture, dramatically. With your experience in Russia, disinformation, and, and work at the Atlantic, Atlantic Council, Dr. Peryakova, can you tell us the importance of this and how this contradictions, how these contradictions and uh, lack of resolve sometimes can really drastically and profoundly undercut our effort with our most important allies, which is what we're talking about here today. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I, would, I would agree with you on the point that uh, the administration has been sending very mixed messages to our allies in Europe. Um, on the one hand, we've increased um, to a great degree our support for EDI, which I think has been a very good thing. Um, also, the Baltic Reassurance uh, Initiative proposal, which is uh, uh, on the floor of this House, um, and the increase in rotational forces in Poland. So on the security defense issue... That's I fine. I want you to deal with the other issues. Okay. I want you to deal with actions like the phone call asking President Zelensky to investigate his own country. I want to ask you about what message that sends to our allies and to Russia when Lavrov is here in the shadow of those peace talks and we still haven't had President Zelensky to the White House for an official visit. Well, my concern is that the message being received is that uh, U.S. support for Ukraine um, is more tenuous than it actually needs to be and should be to deter further Russian aggression in that country. For that reason, I think it's important, especially for the United States Congress, to take a strong stand and uh, reassure Ukraine um, through the Stand with Ukraine Act, which was passed uh, some, some years ago in, in both uh, houses of Congress. I, I would agree with you that we have seen some uh, fissures in the transatlantic relationship as a result of these kinds of mixed messages from the administration. Great. I have a resolution uh, that I put in quite some time ago uh, in the Foreign Affairs Committee that will demonstrate our commitment to Ukraine and clear the air on some of these issues. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm actually going to yield back some time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hartzler. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I am very grateful that the President did send javelins over there, and whereas the previous administration only sent blankets and MREs, so I appreciate his support uh, for Ukraine. My question is, um, last month, Harvard University professor Charles Lieber was arrested on charges related to his participation in China's Thousand Talents program, and uh, as we know, according to the charges, while Dr. Lieber was receiving over $15 million in funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Defense, Dr. Lieber was also allegedly being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars per month by the Thousand Talents Program to conduct nanotechnology research beneficial to China and recruiting other scientists to work for China. So, Dr. Monken, what is DOD's role in protecting sensitive research here at home? And what policies should DOD implement to safeguard defense research at universities? Uh, thank you. Um, look, I, I think we, at one level, we have a, a clash of, of, of two, different, two different worlds. Uh, a, a world of academic research where the idea is free and open exchange of, of, of information, and the world of national security research where we rightly have to protect, uh, protect research. 
we, we've been able to handle that in the past. Uh, I grew up around uh, oceanographers who did work uh, both uh, for the National Science Foundation and for the US Defense Department. They could walk and chew gum at the same time. I think what we need to do is we need to be very clear as to what is permissible, what isn't permissible, and we need to hold people accountable. And I think it's, a, it's an issue now in part because that the, the ethic has lapsed and you have a lot of folks that are, that are willing to uh, accept money to uh, either to, uh, uh, to benefit themselves or to support their research without really thinking about the, the full consequences. Yeah. It's my understanding that currently when they come here to do the research, they're provided with uh, information about what degree they may be uh, going into. But then as they go through the system and they can change majors, they can uh, go to another program and the State Department, the visa and, and the DOD do not track that. Do you think there should be more supervision of Chinese students um, to make sure that they are not getting into areas that could be a threat to our national security? I think we need to have supervision of students from a whole range of areas to make sure that they're, that they're out of uh, sensitive areas. And on the faculty side, there needs to be a responsibility as well not to be engaging uh, students from, from certain countries uh, as research assistants or, for example, for, for, for their projects. Great. Shifting gears uh, to both you and, and Mr. Denmark, uh, what specific U.S. defense investments should the department prioritize for major state competition? And do you agree with the Army's focus on uh, big six modernization priorities and the Air Force's plan to increase capability and capacity through the modernization of its fleet and increasing the squadron force structure? I think modernization is an imperative uh, because it's been deferred for far too long in far too many areas. Um, I think, and, and particularly the, uh, for, for the Army, I think one of the, the challenges the Army faces is uh, a sort of a split focus. A lot of the Army is focused on Europe and, and countering Russia, and I think that's important. I think that, Ru that the Army also has an important role to play in the Pacific. Navy and the Air Force, just by the nature of, of maritime and sea power, are, are, are more flexible. But I think that's a, that poses a particular challenge for Army modernization. Mr. Denmark. I tend to focus more on the types of capabilities that the United States would need rather than specific systems in my testimony. Um, the United States needs the ability to penetrate and operate within denied spaces and, uh, and eventually degrade uh, China's ability to deny the United States those spaces. So to me, capabilities that are mobile, unpredictable, uh, unmanned, subsurface to me are the most promising sorts of capabilities. I think each service has an important role to play in this area. Um, but it will require new concepts of operations, new kinds of investments, and a new posture. Very good. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to add, uh, Dr. Polakova? Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Kim. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on out here. I, I just want to kind of take a step back a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the, the last time we were engaged as a, as a nation in, in real great power competition, um, you know, during the Cold War, I think, you know, there, there was a, a lot of understanding in the American people what was at stake and the threat that was faced. But I'll tell you, you know, in, in my district uh, in New Jersey, you know, I, I feel like we're, st we're still not kind of punching together a, a clear and coherent and, and kind of pithy explanation of, of what exactly is at stake and why should people care about it? So if you wouldn't mind, I'd just like to ask the three of you, just to, how would you explain to people in my district why they should care about this? Why they should care about, uh, about China and, and Russia and, and this great power competition uh, as opposed to how we talked about it a couple decades ago? Doctor? I don't know this will be as pithy as, as you would like, <laughs> Congressman, uh, but I think the critical point here is that the reason why the United States has enjoyed relative security and prosperity is because we have had allies across the world um, to put forward our vision of democracy. And the reason why we have a democratic society here in the United States and in Europe is because of U.S. leadership um, across the world. And it is exactly this U.S. leadership and our model of democracy, our basic principles of human rights, uh, freedom of speech, freedom to, of assembly, are actively being undermined and challenged by these countries. Okay. Mr. Denmark? I would add to that, to that very excellent answer. Um, the reason there has not been a major war in Asia uh, since the Korean War um, in, between major powers um, is because of American political and military leadership. 
Um, and what's at stake is really the, the future destiny of the 21st century in, in the Indo-Pacific. There was an article in uh, FT last year that pointed out um, that this year, 2020, is the, is the year when Asian economies will be larger than the rest of the world combined, as measured by PPP. And so America's future is in the Indo-Pacific. In order to sustain that stability, to sustain that prosperity, the United States needs to sustain its leadership and its geopolitical power. Yeah. Dr. Monkin, yeah. over to you. Look, I think uh, as, as Americans, we tend to see peace as the natural state of things, and war as kind of an inconvenient, temporary aberration. Because of that, I think we, and we also tend to think that, you know, our values are, are, are universal, that, that, that of course everybody craves democracy, everybody craves prosperity. Uh, and so because of that, I think it's very easy to overlook the fact that we face increasingly powerful challengers who see the world of, in a fundamentally different way. Yeah. And that I think ultimately what is it at, at stake is, is our, our way of life, whether it's, whether it's internationally or, or even, say, in, in the classroom, the, the future of, 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 of free and open exchange uh, in, in the classroom when it comes to um, students that, that may not be interested in those types of things. Yeah. We engage in self-censorship. So that's part of how I would, I would make the case. Well, w one part that helps bring that to light is, is not just about understanding the threat or understanding the challenges, but trying to understand you know, what is our right approach back. And, you know, I think for, for, for better or worse, uh, you know, you, know there, you can sum up kind of Cold War with that kind of long telegram approach, the containment side of things, things of that nature. Uh, I feel like, you know, I'm struggling to understand, you know, if there's sort of a guiding principle here that you could see in terms of, of where we're at now. Um, no longer, not just kind of this, you know, can't really necessarily dust off a neo-containment policy necessarily. Um, and I think there are also maybe some areas of cooperation that we need to be able to explore with some of these uh, competitors. But I'd love to just get your thoughts of just how do we try to condense down and, and try to, you know, come up with an understandable concept for you know, folks in my district around this country to understand, you know, what is our guiding principle? What is our actual strategy here besides a, a big, thick document? Um, I think our guiding strategy has to be to promote uh, democratic values and principles across the world because no two democracies have ever gone to war with each other. And I don't think we as a society have direct experience of what it's like to shed blood um, and treasure for those values and principles, and we're losing that connection. Um, and one of the narratives and the ideological battles in which Russia and China are involved in is to try to have a false equivalence narrative that an authoritarian strongman society is the same as a democratic society. And that is false, and we have to work actively to dispel these kinds of disinformation narratives. Sure. Well, look, my time is up, so I'll yield back, but I'd love to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of things I would mention. One is uh, with regard to our military, if we, if we double the size of our military, we, we would still have capacity issues when it comes to um, areas like Africa. And um, while I think the committee has tried through things like the uh, ECHO programs to, to build those partnerships, um, I, I do think we need to redouble those efforts because the only, the only way to combat Russia and China in, in those areas that are geographically a long way away from us is to strengthen the partnerships with countries that share our values and our interest. Um, with that said, we've talked about Africa some, we've talked about Europe some. What we haven't talked about much is the Western Hemisphere in uh, South America and Central America. Uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative is, to me, uh, effectively the recolonization, uh, not just of Africa, but the world through... Uh, through lending where, where they could intentionally trigger systemic debt related issues uh, for the solvency of a, of a country. And so when, when we talk about communist China and we talk about a military buildup, my question gets to the, the center of gravity of communist China. Is their center of gravity uh, the Belt and Road Initiative where they can trigger systemic debt related crises in countries, or is their center of gravity the military? And why are we not talking about this with regard to the Western Hemisphere? 
If you, thank you, Congressman. I think if you look at China's approach to Central and South America in terms of Belt and Road and economic initiatives, um, I think there's a driver of China's approach that goes beyond the debt trap challenge that you mentioned, um, which is not ubiquitous in all of China's trade agreements, and it's actually something that Beijing has tried to address once it got a lot of public criticism for that. Um, China's, a key element of Chinese Communist Party political ideology, which is reflected in its trade policy, is that economic alignment will lead to political alignment, either because of greater contact, because of greater sympathy between those two societies, um, but at the very least in a more real politic sense that economic dependency leads, gives China more leverage over those countries. And would would you agree that that leverage could lead to the construction of military bases in the Western Hemisphere very close to the United States? I think at some point it could. Um, I think the Chinese were certainly, I expect the Chinese would be looking at that, but I also think that it's an area where the United States is very capable of competing if it's able to leverage not only its military uh, influence with those countries, but especially political and economic leverage with those countries so that th those countries see that they have a choice and they don't have to go with the Chinese. I, I want to give the other two a, a, quite, a, a chance to answer, but you know, is the center of gravity the military or is the center, center of gravity the Belt and Road Initiative? In Central and South America, I, I'd say it's- For China. For China? Um, I'd say for China, um, it goes across a lot of different measures of national power. I'd say economics right. is an important thing. Let me let the others military. answer. So. Overall for China, I'd actually say it's the, the Chinese population. That's what that's what keeps the Chinese Communist Party leadership up at night, and the you know the 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 concern about the allure of democracy, the the lure uh, of of prosperity. I think that's that's the ultimate center of gravity for 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 China, ma'am. I will just briefly comment that we should not forget the fact that Russia is also involved in the Western Hemisphere in the sure. same way that it's involved in in various parts of Africa as well, most notably in Venezuela. So do you think the center of gravity for, for China is the, is the military, or is it, is it the economics? I, I am not a China scholar, so I defer to my colleagues on that. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank you for being here. I will tell you, I'm very concerned that we don't pay enough attention to the Western Hemisphere. We have spent trillions of dollars in, in, in areas over the last several decades um, that, are, that are a long, long way from, from the United States. And uh, I'm very concerned that we're not watching what's happening in our backyard and that we may wake up one day where the trade relationships with China especially uh, are so strong with some of those countries that uh, China is able to use their influence to build military bases uh, effectively uh, in our backyard. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to the witnesses for being here today. Um, I know uh, Mr. Whitman uh, alluded while I was out of the, the room, uh, Dr. Manke, Mankin, uh, about your report from uh, last year, Sustaining the Fight, Resilient Maritime Logistics for a New Era. And, um, you know, yesterday we uh, had a budget that was released that um, contained uh, really the smallest requests for shipbuilding, uh, going back probably about 10 or 11 years, uh, eight ships, two of them are tugboats, um, they cut a, a Virginia-class submarine uh, that was part of the program of record going back to 2011. Uh, I, I just wonder if you could comment in terms of how does that square with a uh, national defense strategy that clearly, you know, um, has a huge air and naval um, requirement if we're going to really be serious about, um, you know, pursuing it. Thank you, Congressman. Look, the United States has been, from its founding, a, a maritime power, a, a sea power. A strong navy is is vital, and you know, our surface fleet is you know one of those areas where we've deferred modernization, and and there needs to be a lot more done, um, not only to you know to produce newer ships, but also more capable and probably more. Um, whether the number is 355 or north of 355 and whatever we count in that. Um, so, yeah, I think substantial effort is, is needed there. Well, I mean, eight ships doesn't even get you to probably 305, uh, let alone uh, 355. I don't know, you were nodding your head, uh, Mr. Demark. I don't know if you want to comment. Well, I was, I was reacting because there was a report last, uh, at the end of last year that there was one 
uh, shipyard in China that produced nine ships just, in, just last year alone. Uh, so in terms of pace of naval power development, um, the Chinese are catching up rapidly. And that combined with advantages they have in terms of geography, in terms of being able to focus on a limited number of contingencies gives them um, a lot of room where they can have a dis distinct advantage in the naval space. Well, thank you. And Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Admiral Woody Lewis, who's in charge of the European um, Naval Forces, reported this past fall that there were eight uh, Russian submarines uh, actively deployed in the Atlantic region. I mean, this is not uh, just an Indo-Pacific issue uh, in terms of just the, you know, where Putin is, is uh, focusing his investments in terms of uh, his capital ships. Um, absolutely. Uh, although uh, Russian naval forces... Uh, pale in comparison to the United States and will not be able to keep up with Chinese development. Russia is aggressively challenging uh, U.S. and NATO allies in the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea um, uh, on a daily basis. Um, and I think we have not responded in a way that sends a clear signal to them. Uh, these kinds of challenges to our NATO allies are not acceptable. Thank you. Um, uh, I think it was Mr. Denmark, you talked about, again, the, the sort of technology ed edge that the U.S. has you know, in terms of being a, a critical sort of asset in terms of uh, dealing with China's uh, rising influence in, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, you know, one issue, and I, it may have come up while I was out, but uh, is the whole issue of 5G. And, um, you know, we uh, obviously saw a pretty impressive um, stand that was taken by Australia and, and, and Europe, Norway, in terms of, uh, you know, refusing to uh, go the path of uh, using Huawei as their 5G uh, provider. We're struggling, it looks like, with the UK um, in terms of that. I, I just wonder if you could sort of comment in terms of just that as being sort of a, a real, you know, front and center, real-time issue that, that you alluded to. Yeah, I, v 5G is a very important issue, um, both because of what it is and also because of what, what it represents. Um, 5G is an important emerging technology. It's more than just a new cell phone standard that'll get us better speeds to watch videos, but rather um, it's going to change a lot about how infrastructure works, about how digital information is passed, and the use of Chinese systems, but also China being able to set standards in 5G is going to be very, uh, very important. But it's also, I think, representative of how the United States needs to be able to prioritize competition outside of the military realm, um, in that the military is, is not going to convince the Germans or the Brits or whomever about whether or not to allow five, uh, Huawei into their 5G networks, but rather that's a function of American prioritization and also our diplomatic, economic, and technological capabilities. If I may, um, on the European question, uh, the 5G is incredibly divisive at the European level. We see Eastern European countries, Central Eastern European countries like Poland, Romania, Estonia taking a much more assertive stance um, on 5G. I think the biggest concern with 5G technology is the infrastructure question because if we allow you know, Huawei and other Chinese companies to develop the infrastructure, these technologies build on each other. So it sets us on a certain path uh, will be much more costly and much more difficult to roll it back even if we develop competitive technologies in the way that, that my colleague just suggested. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Denmark, you worked in the Obama administration. You saw firsthand DOD's response to China. I want to talk a little bit about missiles, specifically missiles with intermediate ranges. I applaud your testimony for recognizing the importance of, quote, developing and deploying conventionally armed ground-based missiles previously prohibited by the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. You go on to write that this capability will help the United States develop a more dispersed, unpredictable, resilient, and mobile force with greater efficiency and fiscal sustainability. Uh, can you just elaborate a bit on this point and the opportunities that we may be provided now that we are unconstrained by the INF? Sure. Uh, thank you for, for the question. Um, the security situation, the security environment in Asia developed outside of the INF Treaty. China was not a party to it. Really, the only Indo-Pacific country that was a party to it was the United States. So China has developed a significant number of missiles that would violate the INF Treaty. Uh, it's been previously said that something about 90% of China's ground-based missiles would violate the INF Treaty in terms of its range. Uh, so it's something that the Chinese see a lot of value in. So from an American point of view, I think it gives us options in terms of a more distributed force, um, but it's also more fiscally sustainable in that a ground-based mobile system would be cheaper, a cheaper way of developing missiles than uh, an expensive uh, Aegis destroyer or F-35, for example. Um, 
in that it is distributive. I do think we need to be a bit nuanced in how we talk about these missiles in that we tend to group together cruise missiles of that range and ballistic missiles of that range. I think they're actually quite different. Mm -hmm. I think the Chinese see them very differently. Um, and I think they provide very different sorts of military applications. Mm -hmm. To me, the anti-ship cruise missiles of those ranges is very clearly advantageous to the United States and something that we should take a look at. Whereas I think ballistic missiles of that range, I think, are more complicated in terms of their military use, but also their effects in terms of strategic stability in the region. And it's something that needs to be taken a look at, um, both inter internally, but also in terms of hopeful at some point discussions with the Chinese on regional strategic stability. And what about the access agreements we would need to negotiate with our allies in order to deploy those missiles? I mean, we were told that this was impossible, but I believe we just announced a sale to the Aussies of a variety of LRASMs to the tune of a billion dollars. So there seems to be at least a discussion going on. Well, the Japanese um, are, are um, looking at missiles of, of a similar range, developing those indigenously. Um, there's, I think, Serious, certainly going to be a challenge mm -hmm. in terms of these negotiations, but I do think that they would serve some degree of, of help uh, just having them in Guam, in American territory in Guam, and then gradually expanding from there with exercises for dispersal with our allies and partners, eventually getting to agreements where we could actually forward base them. I think it's achievable, even though right now it, there's nobody who's welcoming them in with open arms. And Dr. Mock and I, I'd, I'd love for you to maybe comment on how INF non-compliant ground-based intermediate range missiles would fit within the concept of deterrence that you elaborate in your testimony? So a lot's been uh, made of the threat that China poses to U.S. power projection forces, but China faces uh, vulnerabilities of its own. The fact that its, uh, its access to the broad Pacific Ocean is constrained by what they call the first island chain, what I like to call our allies and friends. And so deployment of, uh, of missiles along that first island chain uh, would, would force the Chinese leadership to accept a greater degree of uncertainty than it's had to uh, in the success of its operations, whether contemplated against Taiwan, Japan, others. Uh, it would likely force them to shift resources because it would pose them uh, a challenge that they haven't had to deal with before. It would force them to, to shift resources to the defense which I think is all to the good. Mm -hmm. And it would also free up our naval and our, our air forces to use their greatest attribute, which is their maneuverability, <coughs> rather than being tied down uh, close, to, uh, close to the Asian mainland. I appreciate that. Uh, just, finally, I mean, we, we have a national defense strategy that everyone seems to think is kind of in the zone of right, saying Indo-Pay comes a priority theater, then you come, and then CENTCOM, we need to find a way to operate more efficiently. Our funding priorities are precisely reversed, right? CENTCOM, 50X Indo-PACOM, UCOM, 2X Indo-PACOM. More, at a broader level, if you believe the Chicago Council's latest poll, most Americans think CENTCOM is the most important theater. So, in 20 seconds, how do we reverse that? <laughs> uh, through, you know, through education, public education, elite education, and just pushing forward. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hulahan. Can I use 20 seconds or a minute of my time to get more of an answer to that question? I direct the Asia program at the Wilson Center, so my whole job is talking about why Asia is so important. I think the economic linkages between the United States and the region are extremely important, um, but the American public tends to get focused more by threats than by opportunities, I think, unfortunately. Um, so as uh, the Chinese and the North Koreans, I think, as, that threats, as those threats evolve, I think it'll become increasingly more apparent about what's at stake and why the United States needs to be uh, retain its leadership role in the region. That's the short version. Anybody else like to contribute before I get on to my questions? So uh, my questions have to do with, there was a conversation earlier about the role, uh, uh, the importance and concern about the Western Hemisphere and whether Russia and China were involved there and what were our vulnerabilities. My question are, is similar but with the Arctic. Uh, and I was wondering if you guys would be able to comment on what we should be thinking about in that area. Should we maybe be thinking about an ambassador to the Arctic as an example? Are there other ideas that you can have where we are, I am concerned with uh, Belt and Road issues in that particular area and uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Maybe start with Dr. Polikova and then uh, anybody, Mr. Denmark as well. Um, thank you. So Russia certainly um, has, over the years, made considerable moves to kind of plant a flag in the Arctic and to claim 
Arctic resources, its own resources, and that it can. Um, it is in this arena that I think we need to work very closely with our allies. We do have quite a few allies in Europe who are Arctic countries in, in a certain sense of the word. Um, there are areas, I think, of some cooperation that we can also explore with Russia and China, uh, particularly in scientific cooperation and research um, in a way that we used to do during the Cold War era uh, with the Soviet Union in terms of space exploration and space-related uh, research activities. Uh, but this is a, a region that will uh, be of critical importance in the coming decades uh, because of its uh, resources, uh, because of the, the kind of competition that we're going to see play out very directly. Um, I would just once again say that this is an arena that we should be closely cooperating with our allies on. Mr. Denmark. I was able to participate in a conference in Fairbanks, Alaska a few months ago supported uh, by the U.S. military looking at great power competition in the Arctic, um, which is a new realm for them in that the Arctic traditionally over the last several decades has been more, been more of a uh, venue for cooperation rather than for competition. Completely agree with the statement about allies. Um, I think the United States needs to enhance its engagement with the Arctic Council. Um, di diplomatic power, again, being very important, but also um, enhancing our infrastructure in the region in that, it, from a military point of view, but also in terms of other economic uh, venues of engagement with, uh, with the Arctic, the United States does not ha nearly have the kind of infrastructure in place as other uh, Arctic powers have, and that's an area where we could uh, catch up. I would just say that uh, there's the Arctic and there's also Antarctica, mm -hmm. right? And I think in both areas and even, you know, just in the, in the global commons, we really need to be standing up for free and open access, whereas our, our challengers uh, are, you know, increasingly trying to divide things up. And whether it's our, uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, as previously been said, we have, we have a lot of allies, uh, and we need to be working in concert with them to isolate those states that really seek to, to kind of divide things up and, and turn this into a kind of a, a land grab or a resource grab. And is there any value at all to this concept of an Arctic ambassador? Um, would you be able to comment on that? Um, I think that's an interesting idea that is worthy of exploration. Complete, completely agree. Agree. Terrific. And then the last, with the last minute of my time, I'd like to just talk about the fact that we are uh, withdrawing forces from um, Africa, and that doesn't seem consist that seems consistent with the NDS, but doesn't seem consistent with the you know protection and thoughts about Belt and Road, and we're sort of leaving Africa behind if we uh, take troops out. Can you also comment on that and the vulnerability that you perceive that we have, if any, by removing our troops? As I say in my written testimony, um, where the U.S. disengages, uh, the Russians see an opportunity to step in and fill a power vacuum. Uh, what we learn from Syria is that Russia is positioning itself in the same way in Africa as it has in the conflict in Syria. But we can still maintain a relatively small and effective deterrent force in Africa uh, d d despite that. All I'd say in Africa, the face of American power should not be primarily military, um, but rather economic development. Uh, diplomacy. Um, so as long as we sustain a, an, enough of a force to be able to conduct counterterrorism missions, I think whatever troops we pull out of the region will need to be supplemented with greater, uh, greater elements of American development economic engagement. Thank you. And I have run out of time, and I yield back. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Mankin, in your testimony, you write, quote, the United States must invest more in developing artificial intelligence, hypersonic delivery vehicles, autonomous systems, and other advanced technologies. It must also accept greater risk and long-term acquisition programs in order to spur innovation and encourage major leaps in technological capabilities rather than slow incremental growth. I want to focus on that for a moment. I'm, I'm the co-chair of something called the Future of Defense Task Force with Representative Moulton from Massachusetts, and we've been holding a number of hearings and roundtable discussions about this subject. So I'm interested in the investments now that we need to make to invest in, uh, in, in the preparation for the future fight. And so my question is, what steps can the department take to embrace a more risk-tolerant mindset? Well, Congressman, I think part of that's uh, on the department, and I think part of that's on, on, on Congress. You know, my, uh, my, my dad, my, my late father, uh, worked on the Atlas Missile Program. And if you look at what our nation was able to accomplish in a, in a handful of years with the Atlas program, uh, it's, it's really staggering. The only reason that that, was, you know, that that was possible was, well, funding, but also uh, a sense of urgency 
but also a tolerance of risk, a tolerance of failure early on in, in, in programs. And all that you know, uh, seemed like a real natural thing to do in the early Cold War, where we had a sense of vulnerability and, and sense of falling behind. I think we need to recapture that sense of urgency today, where in a number of critical areas, we risk falling behind if we have not already fallen behind. Could you unpack for us a little bit more about what you mean by um, accepting greater risk in long-term acquisition programs? Sure. What does that look like? What I would say is hold, hold the Defense Department accountable for the outcome and you know, set, set, the, you know, set the deadline, uh, but don't micromanage the process getting there. And again, that, that applies to Congress uh, in its oversight role, but also applies to various parts of the Defense Department. Objective-based targets, time-based targets, performance-based targets, and let them get on with the business of harnessing the innovation, harnessing the skills necessary to get there. So, so how can we use that type of um, thinking to foster and grow uh, more small to medium-sized businesses in, in, uh, in the defense technology realm? Well, there's enormous innovation out there in the economy, right? Um, when, when I was last working in the Defense Department, I worked with then Deputy Secretary of uh, Defense Gordon England, and, and Secretary England liked to say, uh, rhetorically, uh, what, you know, what is a defense contractor? And his point was, a defense contractor is any company that's willing to put up with the mountain of regulations that govern uh, dealing with the federal government. And that small fraction is, is what we get to deal with. Um, everybody else gets to deal with the rest. So uh, more uh, opportunities to directly connect those small and mid-sized businesses that are at, that are at the cutting edge. Um, and I know there are, you know, through OTAs and other, other authorities, there are ways to do that. I think more of that, the better. Um, Dr. Polyakova, um, could you expand a little bit on, on some of what you've already shared with us about how the department can better leverage artificial intelligence to support warfare operations? Uh, as elaborating my testimony uh, on, on the Russia question, Russia has in signaled its desire to invest significantly into AI capabilities and technologies. Uh, Russia did release uh, just this past fall as AI strategy as well, uh, which I think purposely does not speak of national security because that will remain opaque. Um, to my mind, it is China, of course, that is the greatest competitor when it comes to technological research and development, uh, particularly in the AI space. While I don't have access to intelligence um, documents or information, I would hope that the United States is investing significant resources in developing the kinds of autonomous capabilities and AI-powered uh, military capabilities, because this is where certainly the Russians and I think the Chinese are investing their resources, and this will be the arena that we'll have to contest with in the future. I don't know, Dr. Mang, can you have anything to expand on that? I think we, the, you know, just talking about AI as a field, it's, it's, a, it's a huge field with so many applications. I think the key things, and I think DARPA's doing good work there, the services are going, doing good work there, is, is identifying the key, you know, the key contributions that AI can make, and in some, some maybe uh, really uh, kind of glamorous, glitzy, but we were talking about logistics earlier. I mean, some of the more promising uh, um, applications may be the decidedly unglamorous field of logistics. We need to identify those, uh, those applications and really push forward with them. Thank you. Ms. Cheryl. <clears throat> Um, thank you so much for being here this morning. Mr. Denmark, can you talk through um, the decision of the Philippines to pull out of the Visiting Forces Agreement, how that's going to impact U.S. influence in the region, and how it may impact the calculations of other states in the region? The, the decision by, uh, by Duterte to withdraw from the, the Visiting Forces Agreement um, C is, I think, very important both in terms of its practical applications, but also what it symbolizes. Um, the United States conducts a significant amount of exercises um, with uh, our Philippine allies. Um, we have access to their military bases, and with, within 180 days of this announcement, that's going to go away. And so the Philippine military's ability to react to potential Chinese coercion, I think, will be damaged dramatically because of that. But in terms of what it signals geopolitically, it shows that China's efforts to engage Duterte um, and uh, a key ally is starting to split off a American treaty ally from the American 
broader sphere of influence, if you will. Um, and to me, that signals to Japan, to Korea, but even beyond that, and more importantly, to non-treaty allies, um, that China is being very effective in their efforts to undermine the credibility and reliability perceptions of American power, um, and that for non-treaty allies uh, in the region, countries like India, it shows that the United States is having trouble responding to that challenge. Now, things may change between there. Uh, Duterte has demonstrated himself to be pretty um, uh, uh, unpredictable, if you will. Um, and so it might not actually be concluded. We'll have to wait and see. I expect the United States will be engaging with them heavily to try to stop it. Um, but in terms of a geopolitical signal, regardless of what happens over the next 180 days, I think the decision is going to reverberate around the region and signal that the United States American influence and power is facing significant challenge from Beijing. And somewhat related, can you talk about um, the uh, law of the sea treaty and whether or not we should ratify it and how that would impact um, our efforts in the region? So I think the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, I think, is a very important element of established international law. Um, for the, from, a, from an American point of view, if the United States is going to be a champion of a liberal order based on established laws and norms, the Convention on the Law of the Sea is an important part of that. Uh, it's something that when the Chinese are further afield from China, they actually adhere to it. Um, when the Chinese sail within 12 nautical miles of an Alaskan island, which they did a few years ago, that's because of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it's what, allow, and it's what allows the United States to conduct freedom of, nav of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea, for example. Um, and by having this law, it shows that these norms are not just American assertions, that this is not just a question of uh, Chinese violations of this law is not just a question of Beijing versus Washington, but rather it shows that Beijing is outside of established laws and norms that other countries adhere to as well. And the power of that law, the power of the international community can therefore push against it. Now, uh, if I could very quickly, I'm sorry I'm taking so long. Um, when the uh, tribunal ruled against Chinese claims in the South China Sea um, in, in 2016, that represented, I think, a great opportunity for the United States. Uh, to show that China's claims were outside of established international law. And we have not pushed that finding as much as we could in a political, diplomatic sense. But the ruling is still there. And I think that it could be a key attribute of the United States, both to push back against Chinese assertions, uh, but also to buttress uh, international laws and norms. Thank you. And Dr. Mankin, um, when you mention investment in programs that are no longer effective in our DOD, which programs specifically are you referring to? Well, I think in particular, there's, you know, we, we've, we've had a whole string of investment, a whole stream of investment focused on counterterrorism, counter, counter insurgency. Uh, and, you know, um, I think we need to move away from, from, from those investments. There, look, there are other investments that we've made that can be repurposed. So we, we've invested a lot in unmanned aerial systems, for example, non stealthy UASs. Uh, for the Middle East and beyond. I think there are a whole host of roles that they can play going, going forward. And I think there's also room for, you know, for retirements, as long as those retirements, retirements of aircraft, retirements of ships, as long as those retirements are paired with modernization, not replacing something with nothing, but replacing something with something, particularly for systems that are nearing the, the end of their life where maintenance costs soar and you're just kind of struggling to keep them online. Better to, to, to let them go and invest in, in new capabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bergman. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Mankin, you uh, made a couple of interesting comments that caught my attention. Um, you said we tend to think our values are universal. You know, I, I would suggest to you, I, I appreciate that comment. I, I've heard others say it slightly different ways. We, d we tend to think that um, other countries share our American values. We tend to think that they share our goals and that they like us, okay? And I think that that leads to blind spots, especially in the latter piece there about who cares about who and what we value and what we intend to do. Now. Um, you also made an earlier comment about the analytical capability of DOD lagging. Um, I guess my concern, 
as, as a member of Congress is that as we look at, at um, voting on allocating money, authorizing money, appropriating money, and all of that that go into the various uh, um, departments, in this case DOD, um, would you care to make any comments on where we might gain advantage, not only in our capability, analytical capability, um, by not just stovepiping money into, in some cases, an antiquated view of how we do things going forward? Because Department of Defense doesn't mean necessarily it's the Department of Analytical Capability. So how would you comment on that? Um, thank you, Congressman. I think, you know, first, first and foremost, analytics within the department give the department's leaders and, 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 uh, and members and, and congressional staffs assurance that the, that, the, that the money is following the strategy. And so the, the lack of analytical capability or the, kind of the, the erosion of analytical capability over time is, is uh, um, but is it time not to, is it time that we begin to leverage as a federal government mm -hmm. the get rid of the stovepipe yeah b because we could be missing the forest for the trees yep. so to speak and that's kind of where I'm driving yeah. with this is that we can't expect departments to be all things to all sure. people we have to put them especially in the you know it used yeah. to be before the digital age it was the the big eight the small. Hmm? Now it's the fast eat the slow, yeah. and whether we're talking war fighting, whether we're talking diplomacy, whether we're talking international aid, well, you name it, that that um, intercommunication hmm? between aid, between different entities trying yeah. to do it. But I guess I'm again I'm I'm concerned that as Congress, if we just put money into the same way of doing things and we expect different results, we obviously sure. Okay. And if we look back, it's a it's a it's a flawed it's a flawed analogy uh, because I don't think we're, we're we're headed for a new Cold War. But if we go back and look at the Cold War, and look at the way the national security uh, community was was structured, if we if we look at the way we thought about competing against the Soviet Union, uh, there were a whole host of activities that the U.S. government, just to take a narrow part of it, because it was it was much broader than the U.S. government, uh, thought about. Uh, competition, so not just in in military terms, not just in terms of diplomacy and development, but industrial policy, internal security, development, a whole a whole bunch of areas. Now, of course, that that didn't arise overnight, and it didn't arise, uh, you know, with a strong. I hate to cut you off because you can talk for a long time, but you got a lot to say. Sure. I mean, I, I appreciate that. Are we at a point where we can make gains? by uh, trimming the bureaucracies to reflect the future needs? One of the, yeah, I'll, I'll say yes. And, and I would say because uh, if we look at the post-Cold War world, you know, many of those institutions that grew up over decades are kind of still with us. Some still performing their jobs, some not performing their jobs. So I think both some, some trimming in some areas, but adding in others is, is warranted. Yeah, and thank you, because that's managing change. And I would guarantee you, unfortunately, there are still job descriptions within the federal government for file clerks. Not that it wasn't a great job when we needed it, but right now that, that job, that FTE has passed. But thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Torres Small. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for your testimony. I know that a lot of the discussion today has been uh, focused on alliances and how do we build and continue to uh, use and leverage our strategic alliances. And one of the areas that I'm uh, deeply interested in is Latin America. Uh, we've seen increased investments in China and Russia um, trying to, to create, as I think um, it's been mentioned before, uh, looking at these power vacuums and how uh, we're, we're taking, uh, how they can take advantage of that. So would you agree that Russia is using power projection in an attempt to erode U.S. leadership and challenge U.S. influence in the Western Hemisphere? Yes, I would agree with that statement. And could you expand a little bit upon some of the, the most uh, challenging ways that they're doing that? 
Um, again, I think the Russian model is more of a short-term, high-impact approach versus the Chinese model, which is more of a long-term, uh, but high-impact in the long-term approach. Um, Russia is incredibly strapped for its own resources. Increasingly, we're seeing intensifying proxy warfare, uh, whether that be through the use of disinformation campaigns in the digital space, uh, which often are linked to the kinds of proxy uh, military groups that we see operating on the ground there. And, and Dr. Polyakova, if, if you can give any specific examples in the Western hemisphere, Hemisphere. Um, I will caveat to say that I'm not uh, an expert on the Western Hemisphere. However, uh, Russia is involved in Venezuela in, and there have been some mixed reports, I would say, in the open source in terms of their activities in support of Maduro especially. But I think it is, uh, I can say with some confidence based on open source reporting, uh, that the Russians have uh, exported their model of supporting authoritarian uh, leaders, particularly uh, Maduro and Venezuela, uh, to, uh, the southern, to the Western Hemisphere. And how does that influence impact our ability to maintain alliances and also provide humanitarian assistance in the region? Uh, I'm glad you brought up the, the development question that has come up several times in this, in this conversation. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, we have to understand that uh, Russia has been emboldened in recent years. Um, the idea that the Russians would be active at all in what uh, the U.S. considers its you know, own backyard um, is, is quite shocking. Uh, one of the ways in which I think we have dropped the ball in some of these countries um, is by cutting some of our assistance and development and democracy programs in the region, which I think should be the, the front face of U.S. power projection there. And, and just lastly, what are, how should we balance our need to have a global force posture um, and then com comparing that to repositioning forces forward to counter a more direct threat from Russia and China? Dr. Minkin. So look, basic fact, we are a global power. We're not a regional power, we're not a super regional power, we're, we're, we're a global power. Um, fortunately, we're a global power that has uh, allies uh, and those allied and allied territory is a key component of, of forward deployment. We forward deploy to deter, but also to reassure our allies, both in, both in Europe and, and Japan, or in, uh, in Asia, rather, the Western Pacific. Uh, and then we also have sovereign territory in the Western Pacific as well. So it is, it is a balancing act. We need to deter, we need to reassure forward, but we also need the flexibility to be able to operate globally. And I think that's a, that's a continuing balance that needs to be struck, and it needs to be struck uh, in conversation with, with our allies. And I apologize, I just want to shift very quickly. There's been a lot of discussion on the civil uh, governmental com coordination in China that, that allows them to leverage a lot of investment. Uh, we've talked a lot about how we can support innovation in that same realm, but are there any vulnerabilities that that causes with China um, when there is such coordination between the civil and governmental? In China, it's more civil and party than civil and governmental, but it's the same, <laughs> same point. Um, I think there's tremendous vulnerabilities in China's system, and we're seeing some of those play out with China's response to the coronavirus, in that there are uh, there are structural uh, impediments to open sharing of information, of giving the central government bad news, mm. of the central government learning what's happening, and then the central government being able to actually implement a change of strategy uh, because of the distribution of power in China. And I think that applies across the board in the economic realm as well. Beyond that, there are significant um, bases of power that support uh, inefficient economic models in China in terms of state-owned enterprises, which crowd out financing uh, for small businesses, for more innovative businesses, um, while at the same time an over-reliance on overproduction debt, um, which is really having problems and showing some of the problems now. As China's economy slows, a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these weaknesses are starting to become more and more apparent. Thank you. I yield the remainder of my time. Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for sharing your expertise and experience today. Uh, my first question is for doc Dr. Polyakova. Uh, you know, we have a lot of our stealth capabilities in the Indo-Pacific region right now. Uh, do, you, do you think we have enough stealth capability in Europe to deter? Stealth capability? Yeah, stealth, like fifth generation aircraft. I think the deterrence posture of the United States is decisively different in Europe than it is in the Indo-Pacific. I'll let my colleagues address the Indo-Pacific region. I'm more, more such a, do we have enough in Europe? Just want to get your perspective. 
Uh, my sense of our deterrence capability in Europe is, is that the investments we're making now must focus on interoperability and military mobility versus um, investing new capabilities in the region. Because our allies should do more and they can do more, and we should continue to prompt and support their ability to do so versus continuing to supply um, our own uh, systems and capabilities there. So you feel the same way when it comes to armor as well? Because we used to have 5,000 tanks assigned right. there in the 80s. Now we have a rotating brigade. Are you, do you think this is adequate? Um, I think that is a point of debate that we need to engage in in a real way. Um, I think the recent increase in rotational forces in Poland has been a positive development. Um, I think the constant uh, balance we have to strike is to what extent we want to take the escalation burden on ourselves versus placing on Russia. I think right now the uh, national security strategy in the NDS is strategically uh, trying to shift the burden to Russia versus to our allies and ourselves. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Denmark, I, I appreciate your comments on the intermediate range missiles. They have a conventional missile capability to counter China. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we have a disadvantage there and they can hold us at risk at our bases. Uh, switching topics, are we doing enough to engage Taiwan to help deter what China's doing? Uh, can we do more? Because there are freedom loving people and they want to do more with us and they, they want to remain independent. Uh, I'm very glad that you raised Taiwan. Um, I think, agree that Taiwan is a very important, if unofficial, uh, partner of the United States. I think they show that some values in terms of an embrace of political and economic liberalism are not based on culture and history, but rather they're more universal than, so, than folks in Beijing would like to argue. Um, I do think that we could be doing more with Taiwan, um, but likely not in the security military area. I think the security and military cooperation with Taiwan has been very good. Um, there's been continued arms sales across administrations for a long time, and I think those are very helpful in terms of preserving deterrence. I think that cooperation in the military sphere could adjust a bit, emphasizing uh, asymmetry. Um, but in terms of where we need to build our relationship with Taiwan, I would focus much more in the economic realm. Um, that. Uh, Taiwan is very vulnerable um, to China in part because of its economic reliance on the mainland. And um, working with Taiwan in terms of um, enhancing trade both bilaterally with Taiwan but, but helping Taiwan enhance its trade with the rest of the Indo-Pacific, not just through the mainland, would very much help them uh, sustain their own system and reduce their vulnerability to the mainland. I know the Taiwanese leadership would love to have a trade deal with America. In fact, their senior leadership told me they could do it in one day. I think we ought to try to get that done. I think that would be important. Dr. Mankin, I want to ask you about two areas if I have time to do it. Do you, I, three years ago, I thought we had a very uh, big deficiency in electronic warfare, and I think we've come a long way. Uh, how do you think that we've prioritized electronic warfare when you look at the capabilities of China and Russia? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think we are making strides there, but we are, we are playing from behind, right? Uh, Russia, China have had... Uh, very dedicated approaches to, to electronic warfare. In the case of the Russians, a lot of battlefield experience. Uh, and so, you know, we, we need to, uh, to, to focus on the areas where we can make real, real gains. Um, and I think we have made some strides, but again, we're, we're, we're playing from behind on that one. And maybe a question on ISR. I believe that we need the fifth gen ISR capability in a phase four operation when, a, when you're in the middle of a fight. But phase zero and phase one, where we're at today, you need your traditional ISR that can really do the job. So I think we need a blend. Yep. Have you, do you think we're in the right spot, heading in the right direction with our ISR blended of fifth gen current capabilities in space? Yeah, so uh, I think your, your point is spot on. And, and in my written testimony, I, I talk uh, a little bit about that. And we actually have a, a report that's going to be forthcoming uh, on the topic of, of ISR in, in the competition phase. And there, I think, yeah, the, whether it's uh, um, platforms like Global Hawk or like Reaper, um, manned platforms, I think there's, there's uh, a strong case to be made for knitting those together to provide 24-7 uh, situational awareness in areas that we're concerned about. Uh, first and foremost, because that's a deterrent. When others are, know that we're watching, they tend to be on better behavior. Thank you. Um, Mr. Yield. Thank Mr. You. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I've, I've been sitting here listening, and I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you all uh, for your testimony. I found it very informative. Uh, I think I am last, so I thought I had an opportunity to kind of help us clean uh, this thing up. 
Um, if you could do me a favor and imagine that you were back home with me in Maine, uh, in like a town hall setting with some farmers, lobstermen, uh, people working in a paper mill, uh, where they're also uh, selling some product that's papers being made in, in uh, China and in factories over there, or a uh, small business owner, children, whoever, you can imagine the crowd. Uh, I think sometimes here we take it for granted that the American people understand why it is that we ask them to assume these great investments in our military and also in a, a two plus three strategy. And Mr. Mankin, you said we, you stated that we are a global power. So uh, why does that matter to the everyday American citizen. And when we're talking about China and, and specifically, what is the scenario that the American people should be most worried about in the future? Is it, uh, is it a Pearl Harbor-like attack, a West Coast missile strike on the West Coast? Is it uh, a China who continues to pick off our allies, shuts us out of that economic market, market of the future that you're talking about? What specifically, wh why does this hearing matter to my constituents? So, Congressman, when, when I'm back home in San Diego, it, it's, it's a little bit easier to make that case uh, about the Pacific than, than perhaps. No, but make it for make, anyone. I mean, yeah, we're, we're one country. But absolutely. But, but I think Americans, you know, small town America, take a lot of things for granted. You know, they take, it, and, and they've been allowed to because it's invisible, right? They, they take rapid reliable access to the global commons and all that comes with it for granted. That's, that's, that's spurred globalization, that's spurred economic prosperity from small town America across the globe to include, include China. All of, that, all of that has rested invisibly often on American power. And it was actually, I think Joe Nye said, you know, that, that security is like oxygen. You only notice it when, when it's running out. So, in part, the, the situation you face, we face, is, is, is a good one, or is a byproduct of, of, of a good situation. What was a good situation? I agree with you, uh, though, that you have, we have to make the case going forward um, that the things that we care about, whether it's material goods or our values, uh, are, worth, are worth defending. And either we defend them now, far from our shores, through our allies, through our relationships, through deterrence, or we're going to have to either see them go away or, or have to fight them in, in another way. From an economic standpoint, it is uh, whether or not we continue to be successful and be able to tap into these markets uh, and continue to see our economy grow, is what you're saying. Um, but I thought you just made a good point there. I've heard some very smart generals uh, talk about when it comes to combat, we'd rather play an away game than, than a home game. Um, I think that's... I think that is absolutely correct. We've been very fortunate. Uh, and thinking about the two plus three uh, strategy that we've all talked about, I just a frank question for any one of you. Do you think we're being realistic with the size of the military that we have and the capabilities that we've demonstrated? I mean, we look at the, at the height of the surge in Iraq. Uh, the United States Marine Corps had to become more of a land-based uh, army type military. Uh, you know, uh, su supplement to uh, the army. It was very hard for us to maintain th those wars in, in the Middle East. With what we have today, is it really reasonable to think that we're ready for a conflict uh, in the Pacific while also being able to deter Russian aggression uh, and work with our allies in Europe, plus maintain some kind of, of operational capability from North Africa to Pakistan uh, in regards, I mean, can we do that? Do you all have a degree of confidence that we can do that today? Just very briefly, you know, the type of war that you, you're talking about, a great power war, would be much more consequential than Iraq or Afghanistan. Of course. And it would require much greater exertion, but the stakes would be much higher. So do I think we as a nation are capable of generating that? Yeah, absolutely we are. With an all-volunteer force and, and, and at our current budget levels, and we're, we're on track to be able to meet. Well, not current budget levels, right? Again, if we're talking about if we're talking about a, a big war, uh, historically we haven't fought big wars with peacetime defense budgets. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, it's a weighty issue, so, and I think a good hearing overall. But like I said, um, I think the American people have to understand uh, you know, why it is that, that Congress and the Pentagon, the military, uh, the State Department, and others are talking about these things. There's a lot of skepticism out there. I'm sure you hear about it and read about it. So thanks for a good hearing. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. I read all your statements. I've listened to nearly all the questions, and I've found very little with which I disagree. 
Um, let me ask, though, a couple follow-up things. Uh, Mr. Denmark, you teased us with uh, nuclear deterrence is different in Asia for China than it is for Russia. Um, and I'll, I'd like to hear a little bit uh, about how, considering that it's not just United States and China, there's also North Korea in that mix, uh, which is also a concern of China. So can you give us two minutes of how it's different and how we ought to think about it? Sure. So the way China approaches nuclear deterrence is very different from how Russia approaches it. Uh, China not only faces a nuclear deterrent challenge with the United States, but also they have to look at North Korea, they have to look at Russia, they have to look at India, and that's a wicked challenge for them. So they have adopted a, a no first use policy, um, which they've pledged to not be the first to use nuclear weapons. Um, but at the same time, they've also adopted a strategy of uh, having a minimally acceptable deterrent and that they're not seeking to wipe out an adversary in a nuclear conflict, but rather to be able to hold sufficient, um, sufficient uh, threat of a retaliation in place so that no country would attack them with nuclear weapons. Um, so their number of nuclear weapons that they have is much smaller than what uh, the United States or Russia have. Um, and so they approach these things completely differently. There's been, unlike with the relationship with, with Russia, nuclear dynamics have, not, have been very far from the forefront of our relationship with China. Uh, there have been very few contacts between our two militaries on issues of nuclear weapons and strategic stability. Um, most of those discussions happen between uh, scholars. Um, and so China's approach to these things is very different. So our approach has to be towards deterrence and strategic stability towards China has to be quite different. I'll, I'll make one last point. Um, the Chinese have been enhancing their nuclear capabilities in recent years, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And that is coming out of concern primarily uh, about the American conventional capabilities. Uh, specifically ballistic missile defense and other penetrating strike capabilities that they fear could undermine their ability to conduct a retaliatory strike. And so as they're expanding it, they're not racing to parity. They're not going to try to meet where the Americans or the Russians are. When we try to reach out to them about signing on to a uh, successor to New Start, they say, you're not even close to us. Give us a call when you're within the same neighborhood as where we are. But they don't really see that as their problem. With the introduction, potential introduction of American INF missiles into the Indo-Pacific, they may actually start to be seeing this as a problem for them. And my hope is that we can start having these conversations that we've been trying to have for a long okay. time. Okay, that, that, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mencken, it, I, number one, I appreciate your service on the National Strategy Commission. Uh, in that report and in your testimony today is a lot of talk about innovative new operational concepts. My question that I keep asking is, what can we in Congress do to foster new operational concepts, um, not only with regard to China, but, but uh, other challenges around the world? Yeah, the, uh, I think one of the things that, that uh, Congress can do is to ask the Defense Department to show its homework. Ask the Defense Department to show how the budget request is tied, and that priorities are tied to operational concepts. Um, how, you know, we need X capability and don't need Y capability. H how is that represented in, in, in new operational concepts? Not just at the service level, because I think the services are, are, are doing some, some, some good work. But what's, what's lacking is a joint operational concept or a set of joint operational concepts. National defense strategy, the classified national defense strategy, does a nice job of, of laying out a set of operational challenges that should be driving innovation and should be driving the budget. I think it's, it's incumbent upon Congress to, to ask the Defense Department, have them show exactly how those challenges operational concept development is, is shaping, the, uh, shaping the budget and shaping the program. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. The only, the only thing I would say, and it kind of gets back to a little bit of what uh, General Bergman was talking about, uh, it's also a challenge, I mean, you're talking about matching the operational concepts with the budget, but you gotta have the operational concepts to begin with. And, and so fostering that sort of intellectual uh, effort, like we've done through the, in the Cold War, 
uh, and that has atrophied to some extent, seems to me to be one of our challenges. You make the point, I think, in your testimony, we do all these experimentations and innovation, then it just kind of dies. Uh, nothing really comes of it. And to me, that's one of the biggest challenges we face. It's okay, come up with these ideas, but then make something happen from them. Um, and and as that's particularly true with China, but it's also true with, with other things. Uh, again, thank you all. I'll yield back uh, to Chairman Langevin. Thank you, Ms. Thornberry. I want to thank our witnesses for, for being here today and uh, taking the time out of your schedules to come and discuss this uh, extremely important topic. Uh, Dr. Pavlikova, I'll start with you, if I could, in your testimony. Uh, you stated uh, Moscow will continue to seek out developed and co-op low-cost uh, but high-impact tools of asymmetric warfare, digital technologies, information warfare, uh, and cyber operations to challenge uh, the U.S. and our allies. So my question is, Russia's hybrid operations in the gray zone are well documented. Are the U.S. and our allies getting better at detecting them and countering them? Um, again, I can't speak to any uh, classified uh, sources of information. Uh, what we know from open source is uh, in the malign influence space in the information environment, uh, we are getting much better at understanding how the Russians carry out disinformation operations, and uh, the social media companies are increasingly working more closely uh, with public agencies to coordinate on information sharing. But we need to do a lot more of that. I was very happy to see in the NDAA um, a specific call to establish a coordination center uh, that would allow for more information sharing between the private sector and, and the United States government. I think these kinds of efforts are absolutely critical. I think in the cyberspace is where we face some of the greatest challenges and threats. Uh, the Russians, through, again, proxy groups, but also through uh, their military intelligence units and services, um, have aggressively stepped up their cyber capabilities on the offensive side. And we have just recently uh, basically opened the door for Cybercom to explore offensive capabilities. But I think we need much more of that. I think we need to think of a offensive posture and a defensive posture when it comes to cyber, especially uh, because this is where I see the greatest threat um, in whatever kind of conflict we face in the future, whether it be a great power war that we're talking about or um, another conflict of the nature we've seen in the past with various kinds of rogue states or terrorist organizations. But cyber will play an absolutely uh, changing role, a dramatically changing role in the nature of the outcome of those conflicts. And beyond that, so if maybe a follow-up, what would you say we've learned from this ongoing competition and, and what can we be doing better? Any, any additional thoughts? Um, I think we've clearly learned that we cannot think of warfare in binary terms. Um, I think there has been a tendency to think um, in terms of conventional military power projection and then non-conventional threats as something that uh, the Department of Defense doesn't do, doesn't engage in, um, and if anything, that's the work of public diplomacy in the State Department. And I think what we see now is that our adversaries do not think of warfare in those binary terms. They think of warfare as a spectrum. And I think the reality that we face is that we need to match our uh, responses also from that spectrum perspective as well. And I do see uh, huge improvements in that, again, in the 2020 NDAA, I think is, it was a critical um, uh, uh, law uh, that has really stepped up our capabilities in unconventional space. But I think that is our weak underbelly. That is the soft underbelly of our defensive cap and offensive capabilities. Thank you. Dr. Malkin, I see you nodding. Is there anything you wanted to add? No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we, you know, as, as Americans, as Westerners, we view, we view the world in binary terms. Either we're at peace or we're at war. Or, you know, if we're planning for military operations, although I know the, uh, the, uh, the long-lamented uh, six-phase uh, campaign construct is supposed to uh, uh, have, have gone by the wayside, we think in terms of we're in phase zero all the way up to, you know, uh, decisive operations or post-war operations. But for, that, for us, it's kind of like looking at the part of the iceberg that's above the water. Whereas whether we're talking about the Russians, we're talking about the Chinese, they, they think much more in terms of a, a spectrum of operations. So what concerns me is, yeah, we, we, could, we could lose before we realize or know that we're, that we're at war, or lose without ever having got to that, uh, that major conflict phase. So that, I think that uh, we do need to realign our, our thinking. And DOD, as part of its Title X responsibilities, also probably needs to, to realign the way it thinks about things. Okay. Yeah, I think that happened to us in 2016, that we were uh, unprepared and, and realized it only after the fact when our elections were, were under attack by 
uh, by Russian influence operations. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, our greatest strength in the Indo-PACOM uh, is our allies. Uh, our partnership uh, is a force multiplier that enables a persistent presence in the, in the area. China, uh, as we've discussed uh, today, is attempting to rival our influence through soft and hard power. Uh, Dr. Mankin, uh, you addressed the necessity to update our force posture in the area in order to sustain deterrence and enhance uh, regional uh, resistance to China. In addition to the current uh, force posture, where should the DOD and the Department of State prioritize? Well, in, in addition to our, our current force posture, I, one area I would call out is, um, is Australia. So as the challenge in the Western Pacific increasingly is a challenge in the Indo-Pacific region, I think uh, Australia's strategic geography becomes all the more important. Uh, and so thinking about things that we can do with our Australian allies uh, in terms of joint facilities, the, the Marines have led the way there with uh, the rotational presence in Darwin, but I think there's room for more cooperation there in, in terms of uh, air forces, in terms of naval forces, uh, in terms of even uh, Australian test ranges, uh, I think. So areas like that, uh, I think we should also be exploring uh, opportunities, possibilities with, with Vietnam, with, uh, with others. Uh, that's, yeah, those are the, the, the ideas that immediately come to mind. Very good. Any other, anyone else want to comment? Very briefly, just building off of what uh, Dr. Mankin said. Um, I think there's uh, opportunities and a necessity to diversify our posture within Japan. Uh, from the s relatively small number of large bases to a more distributed approach, uh, new airfields, new new prepositioning of pieces. I'd also take uh, I'd also take a look at uh, the Pacific Islands um, as a potential area for cooperation for um, for building facilities, for building the uh, sort of prepositioning of, of uh, forces of uh, logistics, um, in addition to other places in Southeast Asia that may at some point become more amenable to uh, cooperation in this way. Very good. Well, I want to thank you all for your, your testimony here today. It's been very helpful, insightful, and um, uh, obviously a lot to uh, consider, and to, uh, we have a lot of work to do to follow up. So I uh, appreciate you uh, uh, being here today. Uh, Mac, did you have anything else? Okay. Uh, with that, uh, the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you all.